recognition of guests, the Honorable Premier. Oh, well, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Speaker. Welcome back to my colleagues, uh, to the legislature today, to those who are joining us in the public gallery. I believe that's Susan Hartley. Hello, George Tonian. Uh, <laughs> Smiling underneath there, welcome. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, begin, Mr. Speaker, by offering my uh, congratulations to the Summerside Western Capitals. I know the Honourable Leader of the Third Party was in attendance, as I was, along with almost 3,000 other Islanders, uh, to watch the Western Capitals uh, win the Canadian Tire Cup, uh, emblematic of the Maritime Hockey League. Uh, Colby MacArthur, the MVP, uh, uh, just a, a great effort. They knocked out. Uh, the Truro Bearcats four games to one and now we'll move on to the Centennial Cup the national championship for tier two junior hockey in Estevan Saskatchewan later this month uh, I wanted to congratulate Pat McKeever the general manager Billy uh, McGuigan the coach mm -hmm. there's two individuals who are friends of mine I don't know anybody who works any harder to build a good hockey team year in year out so it's nice to see all of those players and coaches and fans rewarded with a championship. And speaking of hockey champions, uh, we had an island first over the weekend in, uh, in New Glasgow, Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker, the uh, Capital District under 15 uh, AAA uh, girls team uh, for the first time won the Atlantic Championship, Mr. Speaker, uh, winning in double overtime and uh, Callie uh, McDonald scoring the winning goal. And from what I'm told from her not so unbiased father was uh, playing uh, Wilf McDonald type minutes on defense. So anyone who knows uh, the history of island hockey would know that Wilf McDonald didn't take many shifts off and apparently Callie didn't either. So just congratulations to those girls. I think they were undefeated this year in, in Prince Edward Island and capped off a terrific uh, season. So well done. I, I had the opportunity, like many in the chamber, to attend the uh, annual general meeting of the Greater Charlton Area Chamber of Commerce. I wanted to uh, congratulate new uh, President uh, Bill DeBlois. Uh, who takes over that role, uh, taking over for the outgoing uh, uh, President uh, Barb Smith. I uh, wanted to wish uh, the new executive all the best uh, and in the year ahead. They do important work. And I had to leave partway through uh, what was a really, really good speech by Martin Root, who was uh, one of the co-authors of the Chicken Soup for the Soul books, and he was talking about the power of story and business, and uh, I didn't like to leave, but had to come here to uh, face our responsibilities, as we often do, but uh, uh, really, really great to see uh, Martin there and, uh, and listen to uh, his wonderful story. Uh, on Sunday, Mr. Speaker, I got to meet with the executive uh, and, and staff from uh, Swoop uh, Airlines, who began, began service at long last into Prince Edward Island. There was 118 passengers on the flight, the inaugural flight from Hamilton, uh, which is a good sign, uh, and they're going to begin service to Hamilton and Toronto, and then later uh, this year there will be direct service to Edmonton as well through Swoop. It's a, it's a low-cost airline, and uh, we're glad to have them here, and it's nice to see things at the Charlotte Airport uh, getting busier, and I, I expect we'll continue to get busy uh, in the weeks and months ahead. And just finally, Mr. Speaker, many who will be tuned in will notice that most or all of our colleagues are wearing a very important button here today. It's, as today marks a very important day in provincial history. It's 100 years ago uh, when non-Indigenous uh, women uh, were uh, at long last granted the right to vote. Uh, it took many, sadly, many, many years later for Aboriginal and Mi'kmaq women to, to get the right to vote and First Nations women across the country. And I just think on a day like today, it's important to recognize that, yes, we have made some very important strides forward, but we should never forget uh, how far we've had to come uh, Mr. Speaker, and we should never forget that much more work remains to get to uh, equality and, and gender parity, uh, Mr. Speaker, and it's, it's uh, some things in history we should be jumping up to remember, and there's other things that we shouldn't forget uh, because it's amazing when we think of them in, in the context of today uh, that 100 years ago uh, women couldn't vote, vote, Mr. Speaker, for no reason, and it's, uh, it's amazing we've come this far, but we have a lot of work to do. So to all of the women who I've had the pleasure to work with in Inside of this chamber. Uh, I thank you for your amazing contribution. Uh, we've done great work in here and I'm glad to stand beside each and every one of you and we need more welcome here in the days and years ahead. So thank you very much Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you Mr. Speaker and I, I will start off where the Premier left off which is with the 100th anniversary of some island women receiving the franchise on this day exactly 100 years ago May, May the 3rd. And of course, democracy is ever evolving, 
and uh, we have expanded the franchise in a number of ways on a number of occasions over the years that we have had representative democracy here on Prince Edward Island, but as the Premier rightly said, we still have a long way to go. And including, as we did 100 years ago, almost half of the population of this province um, to be able to contribute to elections was obviously an enormous step forward, but it was an incomplete step forward, and as the Premier rightly says, it was expanded further to include all women at various stages between then and today. But we still have a long way to go, and I, I, I'm going to tie in a, a visit I had yesterday. Yesterday was Music Monday, and I had the great pleasure and privilege of attending a concert at Three Oaks um, school in Summerside, and I see we have representatives from Summerside. I should have recognized you right off the top. My apologies. I'll come back to that. And it was an extraordinarily moving thing. These were children who've, who've been taking part in the popular music performance course, which is being piloted right now in a couple of schools in Prince Edward Island, Tosh being one, and the other is in Montague, I believe, high school. And the teacher at Tosh, uh, Krista Bryson, I've known Krista for a long time, and she's a very special person, as are many of the music teachers here on Prince Edward Island. And she's created a very special space there, a space where the youth uh, at that school who take this course are able to challenge themselves to be creative, to do things to push their limits, to um, discover things about themselves, to be part of something bigger than themselves. And the quality of the songs, they were all original pieces. There were 10 or 12 performances, and Summerside Wilmot was there with me. And I'm sure would attest to this. Every one of them was extraordinary. And as I sat there uh, listening to this variety of brilliant performances, I was struck by these are probably none of the youth who were performing that day was 18 years of age. But their awareness of themselves, their awareness of culture of society, which was reflected in the songs that they had written in a very short time, in three weeks, was quite astonishing, really. And of course, one of the areas where I feel very strongly that we need to expand the franchise, as has happened in a number of other jurisdictions around the world, an increasing number of jurisdictions around the world, is to in include 16 and 17-year-olds in our voting. And I think, had you been at that concert yesterday, and of course, there are continuously examples of how engaged, how aware, how brilliant our youth are here on Prince Edward Island, I think you would have no doubt but agree that they are ready to participate in, in elections. Um, another event that I was privileged to attend over the weekend was the uh, Battle of the Atlantic Parade. I was there with the Minister of Fisheries and Communities. And again, a very moving ceremony. And it has special poignancy for me because my grandfather was a sea captain back in Scotland who participated in the Battle of the Atlantic. So it's always, it's always a very moving event for me. And it was beautifully done, uh, very well attended. Um, and uh, it, it was a privilege to be there. I, I do want to recognize the folks in, uh, in the gallery today, Dr. Susan Hartley, who's sitting in the back row. Hi, Susan. It's lovely that you, you are here today. Susan is the president of the Green Party of Prince Edward Island and somebody with whom I'm very privileged to work. And in the front row, I see Bev Cornish. I, I see. Um, Oh my gosh, I, Sandra Hart. Sandra Hart my, my, I'm so sorry, Sandra, you were here the other day. And Toby McDonald, of course, um, all from the Summerside area. And uh, I'm so glad you're here today. I don't know if any of you had a chance to get out to hear the concert I was talking about. I was there during the day at the school, but I know they did a public performance later that day. And it was, it was very special. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I was uh, at Nine Mile Creek Wharf this morning for setting day, and it was extraordinarily exciting. It was one of those perfect island mornings. The sun was split in the sky, and the, the seas were calm, and uh, the feeling on the wharf was very buoyant. And uh, I really wish all our fishers a safe and successful and prosperous fishing season. And I took the opportunity to drop in on um, bait masters there, on Mark and Wally, who. Uh, who are going gangbusters right now because of the, the issues with the bait, um, uh, accessibility to bait. Um, I met their first full-time employee, Melissa, this morning, and I know that they're in the process of hiring others. So there's a real success story 
of an island business which saw an opportunity. Unfortunately, it's it, well, not unfortunately for them, but because of the problems with the herring and mackerel bait fishery, um, their business is now very much in demand in a way that it wasn't before. So congratulations to Mark and Wally and to all the fishers that I met this morning at Nine Creek. It was a special morning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, too, would like to welcome everyone back, and a special welcome to the folks in the gallery. It's nice to see such a presence from Prince County, Bev Cornish and Toby McDonald and Sandra Hart. I'd also like to welcome Susan Hartley as well. Hope you enjoy the proceedings. Mr. Speaker, as was mentioned by the Premier and Leader of the Opposition, it's hard to imagine that 100 years ago today that women got the right to vote. You know, I couldn't imagine that in today's society, and, you know, we've had some wonderful women come through this legislature. You know, there's, there's some wonderful women here right now. We were the first province to have a woman premier. And uh, back in 1970, we had the first woman elected to the Legislative Assembly, Jean Canfield. She won her seat as a Liberal. It's quite a milestone, and, and it's just hard to imagine when you look at things in today's environment that those things would happen in the past. I also want to congratulate the Caps, as the Premier indicated. We were there last night. Great crowd. A lot of children. Everybody enjoyed it. It was, uh, I think it was longer after the game of celebrations than the third period was, but it was, it was a great game and, and it's nice to see them win. Congratulations to the coaching staff and all the players. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I do also want to wish all the fishers a very prosperous and safe fishing season and I hope the weather stays pleasant for them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise today. Um, I had the pleasure, uh, as the Premier mentioned, of attending the Charlottetown Chamber of Commerce AGM this morning. Um, uh, in fact, I was the only MLA there for a while this morning until some others joined a bit later on. But it was really great to be able to hear the Chamber speak about their priorities and strategic plan going forward. And I'm excited to hear that the Partnership for Growth report is, is going to be coming at some point in the next few months. But, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to extend my congratulations to the organizing parents organizing team at Stone Park for organizing and fundraising $7,865 so that every single grade 9 student can attend a semi-formal free of charge. Um, it's been a lot of selling of tickets, and I may have sold some myself, um, but it, it is an incredible thing to do something so inclusive, and I am really excited for all the kids to get to have such an exciting event. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Speaker and a special welcome to, to Susan, Sandra, Bev and Toby. Um, and Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to talk a bit about an event happening this Saturday from 2 to 4 at the Beaconsfield Carriage House. It's a suffragette, suffragette centennial celebration of women getting the right to vote. And uh, last night, Mr. Speaker, I had the pleasure of attending um, the Time of Our Lives. It's a seniors college group art show at the Arts Guild. And there's more than 20 artists featured there, both students and instructors. Very diverse, beautiful art on the, around the walls, and I encourage everyone to go see it. And to everyone watching, everyone around the island, happy setting day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to stand today and extend my condolences to uh, the McDonald family in Stratford. Uh, uh, mother, uh, wife, uh, Margot passed away this past weekend. Uh, she was a major in the uh, Canadian Forces, uh, as was her husband Wally, and uh, they were neighbours of mine. Um, Margot actually outranked her husband in the military, and if you heard them out in the yard uh, when they were doing the gardening, you could tell that she certainly still outranked him. I'd also like to extend my condolences to the children, Robert, John and Susan. And uh, just, uh, you know, Margo is a tremendous person. Uh, I know Lawrence McCauley will miss her tremendously. Uh, she was a huge supporter of Lawrence and, and the Liberal Party. Um, but the truth must be known, it was Margo that actually convinced me into running provincially for the PCs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May 1st, which is now two days ago, was celebrated all over the world as International Workers' Day. In Denmark, it's a national holiday full of parades and political speeches and street parties with citizens celebrating, blissfully ignoring that countries like Russia use the same day to boast of their rockets. I, to prove my uh, 
uh, participation, I still have a red banner in my closet from those times. And I should mention that the color red in most of Europe means NDP and those parties even more to the left. Yeah. Hurrah for workers everywhere. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member from Summerside South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to rise and uh, congratulate the Western Capitals, of course. Uh, I live right beside the place, and uh, I think I could hear the cheers as uh, the game came to an end there. But my son certainly could, Mr. Speaker, is what I really wanted to say. He's six years old, and he attended the game, and I, th I think we've got another lifelong fan of the Western Caps there. And it just goes to show you how much these, uh, these young men serve as role models and uh, something to look up to for our community. So can't underestimate the, uh, the sense of community pride that Summerside's feeling right now after nine years. The trophy's ours again. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> from Charlottetown West Royalty, third party house leader. We just want to say hello to everybody in Charlottetown, West Royalty, District 14. And, and today, um, it should be every day, Mr. Speaker, but today is P Teacher Appreciation Day. Um, so I want to say a, a big shout out to all the teachers, especially the teachers in, in the district I represent. Had a good conversation with a, a couple teachers, and they're working very hard. And this has been a uh, very challenging year, and they keep grinding ahead. So happy, happy uh, Appreciation Day to all the teachers out there. Thank you. I miss anyone? Member statement. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, third party house leader. Yesterday, May 2nd, marked the beginning of Canadian Mental Health Association's 71st annual uh, Mental Health Week. This year, the theme of the week is empathy. I find it a bit coincidental that this week happens to fall in the same time frame where Islanders are struggling more than ever before as they deal with the cost of living crisis in the province. In times like these, people don't normally struggle with mental health issues find themselves struggling now, and those who deal with these issues each day are struggling even more and are at significantly higher risk of self-harm, social isolation, using negative coping mechanisms such as drugs, alcohol, to cope with their emotions. Whether you're an islander living below the poverty line, with the cost of all essential goods and services skyrocketing, or you're a small business owner dealing with the higher cost of operations, staffing shortages, and stress that comes with hearing economic experts warm of the loom and doom crisis. The added pressures on society as a whole right now will challenge us all. Empathy is about being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and encompass the emotions they feel in their own individual situation. It's more than looking at situations from your own perspective and understanding how someone would feel in situations they are experiencing. So as we begin Mental Health Week, I challenge all government ministers to use this as an opportunity for reflection and to take time to empathize with islanders you serve. The highest form of knowledge is empathy. Empathize with newcomers, our homeless population, students, families, and seniors just trying to make it work and, and think, am I doing enough? And what more can I do? Because with empathy comes understanding. And with understanding comes action. And that is what we need right now. Islanders' living livelihoods depend in part on the empathetic leadership you need to show. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Tignesh Pomeroy, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our volunteer fire departments across the island are special groups of people who are willing to risk their lives for their communities. In my district, the Memnigash Fire Department has had a tremendous impact on all residents of the area. Recently, some firefighters were acknowledged for their long-time service and dedication to the department. I had the privilege to attend and award service recognition to all firefighters, including Steve Gallant, who celebrated 53 years, and Ronnie Butler, who celebrated 47 years of service as well. Over the years, this department has had many family members as part of the team, brothers, father-son, father-daughter, and husband and wife teams. As we know, it takes new blood to keep volunteer organizations flowing, and that is why this department also celebrated those firefighters who have been with them for just under five years. These folks are the future generation of the fire department and strengthen the sense of community within Memory Gash. They are Tanner Arsenault, Ryan Bernard, Alan Graham, Doug Wilson, and the newest member, Logan LeClaire. I personally know that this station continues to be under the great leadership of Fire Chief Rob Trombley and Deputy Chief Duffy Shashan. Also, all volunteer firefighters who make up the substanding units, such as Randy Harper, Sandra Jones, Ronnie Bernard, Rachel Butler, Wilbur Shashan, Johnny Perry, Troy Butler, Gerard Shashan, Ronnie Gallant, Andy Perry, Francis Goody, Paul Perry, Mark Deagle, David Ellsworth, Wesley Hustler, Brian Trombley, and Robert Witch. 
Volunteers, like all these firefighters, truly strengthen our communities in many ways. Memnigash firefighters go above and beyond the call of volunteer duty. They organize and implement many community events, such as the Memnigash Days and the Christmas Parade, raising funds for the department and to give back to their loved community. I want to extend my heartful thank you on behalf of their community to the Memnigash Fire Department for their ongoing commitment and personal sacrifices. We truly appreciate all that they do for the community. End of statements. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. No? For a first question, I'll call on the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Lately, we've talked a lot about the cost of living and how that's impacting islanders. And one group of islanders being particularly hard hit at the moment are farmers, um, hit by the high price of diesel, exactly as they're going into planting season. Many in the supply managed sectors like dairy will likely have no choice but to absorb that costs, that, that, those costs and, and take a cut to their bottom line. And some others will have no choice but to pass that on to consumers in the form of higher food prices. So it's a bad situation for farmers, it's a bad situation for islanders. A question to the Minister of Agriculture and Land. Will you be doing anything to help farmers absorb the cost of rising fuel and to help keep food prices from rising even further? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the rising costs of uh, the 2022 crop that we're about to plant here is probably the most expensive, well, without a doubt, the most expensive crop ever planted in the history of Canada, Mr. Speaker, with the high price of fuel and the high price of fertilizer. It's, uh, it's going to be a challenge. Um, the department is has made some efforts uh, lately. We've changed the agri-stability payments, the trigger points, Mr. Speaker, to uh, reflect uh, those extra expenses in uh, the cost of planning this year, Mr. Speaker. And we will con continue to work with our industries across this island to make sure that uh, uh, the crops can go in on, at uh, the best price, and Mr. Speaker. And uh, we have to work hard to ensure that the uh, price at the grocery store stays reasonable as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, and I absolutely agree it will be the most expensive crop ever put in the ground here. And it's going in the most expensive the land has ever been here on Prince Edward Island. In recent years, farmers have been seeing a really steep rise in the cost of land, driven in part by corporations like the Irvings who are buying up large swaths of land and out-competing smaller farmers here on Prince Edward Island. Last week, this government quietly approved the sale of 642 acres of land to three members of the Irving family. But there is no indication that they divested any land, which means that they added this to their total acreage. Question to the minister, with these sales, how much land do the Irvings now control in Prince Edward Island? Culture and land. I want to set the record straight here, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Irving company that every year they do a global lease, they do their global lease, they, they register their leased land, Mr. Speaker. That 600 acre was land that they are leasing in. They register it all, Mr. Speaker. It's all above board, Mr. Speaker. They did not buy any land, Mr. Speaker. It's the same land they lease. They do it in their rotations, Mr. Speaker. It's all above board, so thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, thanks, Mr. Speaker. And if you look at last week's orders in Council, it include not only 642 acres of sold to three members of the Irving family. It also approved another 642 acres to Island Holdings Limited, which is, of course, an Irving-owned corporation. So question to the minister. I'm confused. I have no idea what's going on here. Is this another corporate loophole being used by the Irvings to get around the Lands Protection Act? Or did your government actually approve not just 642, but 1,284 acres of land going to the Irvings? Mr. Speaker, <laughs> let's get the fact. <laughs> Obviously, we'll have to have a, 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 I can't do this in 45 seconds, Mr. Speaker. But this is lease, land that they lease in, lease out. They do crop rotations, Mr. Speaker. They rent land from uh, far, uh, uh, farmers across the island. They register their land. They did not purchase any land, Mr. Speaker. And they're, because they're a non-resident, they have to, it, it shows up twice in the, uh, in the order, Mr. Speaker. 
it's leased land, leased land that they're doing the rotation on. They do this every year, every year at this time. Every year, Mr. Speaker. It's usually around 600 acres, but every year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. And I appreciate the attempt at an explanation, but I mean, the, it's extraordinarily complicated. And, and the fact that it appears in the orders and council there is a sale of 642 acres to three members of the island of the Irving family, you can understand why people are, are confused and upset about this. And the minister seems to be hiding behind this convoluted uh, structure that the Irvings have created around their holdings to resist being transparent with islanders. And, and for what, to what end, you know? What, what, what are we trying to do here? Are we protecting the Irvings? And he's not the only one, of course. There are other, there are other ministers here who are not being less than transparent, shall I say. It's a pattern that seems to have been established with this government. And when islanders voted for doing politics differently, as this premier promised to do, I don't think that they were question. actually expecting to get more secrecy from this government. A question to the premier. Why are your ministers so reluctant to be open and transparent with Islanders? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh, a little incident there at the door. Um, I think this is the most open and transparent government in the history of Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud of you. I guess when I committed to doing government differently and politics differently, Mr. Speaker, I had a partner at one time and the leader of the official opposition who wouldn't just get out and fear monger and twist the facts uh, for the hope of getting a story, Mr. Speaker. But obviously, I've lost my partner in that, in Mr. Speaker. But, but we'll soldier on here, Mr. Speaker. As the minister has said, every firm corporation or every farmer in this province, including those that he named, go through a process under IRAC, Mr. Speaker. If they do a global lease program, they have have to say we're divesting of this through our global lease program and this is the land that we're adding mr speaker it's the level of of of, of closeness that iraq has put in place to monitor this to the very best we could they do it every year every firm corporation does it mr speaker why this honorable member would take the opportunity to try to smear a company mr speaker it just blows my mind mr speaker it blows my mind summerside south drive Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Premier just said this is the most open and transparent government in our history. Well, the Minister of Fisheries and Communities seemed quite confused last week about an investigation he may or may not have conducted into alleged mismanagement in Charlottetown City Council. Despite multiple requests for the Minister to share the report, you know, transparency into, of that investigation, the Minister has yet to share anything other than to say his department shares advice with councils. Again, it seems nobody at the City those who would have been a part of any legitimate investigation has heard anything about this. A question to the Minister. Are you unable to table the report because it doesn't exist? And you never conducted the investigation? Maybe you can tell us the name of the third party that completed the review. Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, I'm very concerned that there appears to be that there appears to be the lack, a lot of conflict, I will say, within the City Council. That there's a lack of respect and cooperation in following what is required. Mr. Speaker, this is not what Islanders expect of our councillors across the island. And Mr. Speaker, I do have the authority under the MGA. There's an authority that I take very seriously and I do not take it lightly. Mr. Speaker, our department and my office will look at anything that comes before us and we will ensure that all facts and all relevant information is looked at, is investigated, and reviewed, and proper decisions will be made. Thank you. Says I find the answer a little bizarre based on the minister's <laughs> previous responses, but uh, previously this minister has been adamant that he does not want to interfere in how municipal councils are run, especially when it comes to human resource issues. But yesterday, The Guardian reported that the minister sent a letter on March 2nd to one Charlottetown city councillor. The language and tone of the minister's letter, similar to now, essentially telling him to do his job. <laughs> The minister mentions great concern that the bylaws were not being honoured, an eyebrow-raising double standard, if you ask me. 
a question to the minister. Why did you intervene with this councillor, but not when serious concerns about financial irregularities with and mismanagement of taxpayers' dollars were raised by whistleblowers? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Community. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, but I'm a little bit confused over this side of the House. We have the Leader of the Opposition, who stood up in front of the Federation of PEI Municipalities last week and gave a speech. He further has stood in this House and he said he supports the powers and the authorities that are given to our municipal leaders across the island and the ability for them to do their job. Here we have the Honourable Member mm -hmm. up in the corner mm -hmm. going completely against what the Leader of the Opposition has said in this House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Summerside South Drive. Thanks for not answering the question there, Minister. Uh, Charlotte Town City Council is now apparently in the process of negotiating a severance package for the CAO at the centre of these concerns. Rumours are it will be in the six figures. I've heard a figure of $500,000 is floating around to make this go away. This is a rather alarming misuse of taxpayer dollars, especially if the concerns were never truly investigated. Love to see that report, Minister. Question to the Minister. Do you agree that someone potentially responsible for serious mismanagement should be given a golden handshake on the taxpayer's dollar, or is this the type of human resources issue you don't interfere with? I'm the Minister of Fisheries and Communities. So now the Honourable Member wants the Minister and the Government of Prince Edward Island to interfere in human resource matters that are between an employer and employee. I think we should allow the City of Charlottetown to deal with their human resource issues and the contracts that they have put in place between their employers and the employee. Thank you. Summerside South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, the letter that uh, was released by the city shows very clearly that you're willing to inter interfere with uh, human resource matters with the city uh, there, Minister. Two deputy CAOs have said they were mistreated by the administration of Charlottetown. Contraventions of the Municipal Government Act, city bylaws and more have been brought to light by these whistleblowers. It's little wonder that any provincial employees are scared to speak out publicly when the messaging from Cabinet is that whistleblowers get fired while alleged corruption gets paid off on the taxpayer's dollar and swept under the rug. Question to the Minister. Is this good governance or bad governance in your circles? The Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It just totally amazes me. It totally amazes me that the Honourable Member is openly attacking our councillors and our mayors across this island and their ability to do their job. We have a member across the way that is basically spreading innuendo and creating rumours and causing falsehoods and going attacking these people that are actually running our communities across this island. As far as I'm concerned, this honourable member has no respect for the members of our councils in the Municipal Government Act. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Everyone in here <laughs> seems to agree that homelessness and addictions are serious issues. And this was highlighted most recently again in the Guardian article titled People Living with Addictions, Homelessness in Charlottetown Using Drugs in Bathrooms After Culvert Closed. And I've actually heard that from constituents. We stand in here and talk tangible, harm reducing solutions, and then this government takes those ideas and either does nothing or does something completely different with them. Rather than creating a safe consumption site to help Islanders today, the Minister of Health has decided to hire a harm reduction coordinator to form a Harm Reduction Committee. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. What is a committee going to tell you that individuals and community organizations have not already told you loud and clear? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, we hear the opposition, we hear the Honourable Member across the way. We hear so often that we're supposed to consult, and we do consult. We listen on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. We have a harm reduction coordinator that is working with uh, the group, and I've said in budget estimates, Mr. Speaker, in case the Honourable Member was not here, but yes, we are rolling out with regard to uh, sites as soon as possible, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
So the official opposition put in a budget request for a safe consumption site last year. Since then, the March 2021 budget address set aside $250,000 to hire a harm reduction coordinator and establish a safe consumption site in PEI. A year later, the provincial harm reduction coordinator was hired, but no safe or supervised consumption site has opened in PEI and no plans have been announced. The deadline for spending the rest of the budgeted $250,000 was March 31st, 2022. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. What did you spend the rest of this money on? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And we look at the, the figures that the, the Honourable Member has put forward here. Yes, we have hired a harm reduction coordinator. Harm reduction is it's quite broad, Mr. Speaker, as the Honourable Member knows. She keeps referring to safe consumption sites, Mr. Speaker. Uh, here, a number of months ago, the federal government provided a class exemption under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, which which covers off, Mr. Speaker, urgent public health needs sites, which means it expedites that process, which our government is making use of that exemption in order to expedite the process, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. That's news to me because that you missed the mark a long time ago. So unless there's been a new process established, you missed that vote. You did. Back in 2020, that's the very first step too. Back in 2020, the city of Charlottetown filled in the culvert, which was a space where people using drugs found community so that they were not using alone. When they lost that culvert, they lost a space that was without stigma and judgment. Now many of them report using alone behind closed doors, which is more, much more dangerous. We know this, yet this government sits as if frozen, completely failing islanders and putting their lives at risk every single day. Question to the minister. Your government has shown that it can get things done when it wants to. Why don't you want to get this done? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the question. Why don't we want to get it done? We do want to get it done. Do it. We will be getting it done, Mr. Speaker, as the member has alluded to. When this government sees something that needs to be done for Islanders, we take the bull by the horns, Mr. Speaker, and we get it done. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member spoke about that it was news to her. Well, I would ask that the Honourable Member maybe have some of her research team look at the difference between urgent public health needs site and safe consumption sites with the realization that there is very little difference there and the fact that the, under the Controlled Substan Drugs and Substances Act, Mr. Speaker, that it allows the province to move forward much more rapidly than if we were looking at a safe consumption site. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. The pandemic, government introduced programs such as the Workplace Adaptation Assistance Fund and the Business Adaptation Program to support businesses, entrepreneurs, not for profits, and non governmental organizations to adapt to or recover from the impacts of COVID 19. Of course, a lot has changed since these programs were available. Question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. As we work to build back better, will you consider reintroducing programs to support businesses to thrive within the evolving and ongoing challenges presented by COVID-19? Tourism and Culture. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. So uh, every day we're working uh, with industry and the business community, uh, checking in to see uh, to see how things are going, to see how everybody's navigating through the pandemic, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we know COVID is still here, uh, so we're constantly working with the business community. When a problem arises, we'll uh, we'll certainly work uh, work with it, and uh, if we need to uh, extend further, we certainly will. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Time Valley, Sherbrooke of what we have learned since the start of the pandemic is the importance of quality ventilation systems to prevent the spread of airborne, airborne illnesses such as COVID. Ventilation has been shown to be one of the most critical and effective ways to slow the spread of these viruses in indoor spaces. More critical than ever, now we are lifting mask mandates. Question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. How are you supporting businesses to upgrade their ventilation systems to better protect customers and workers? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, honourable members. So, uh, any of our programs uh, under innovation PEI would uh, would could possibly look at this. So, we have uh, programs for for equipment purchases, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, from my understanding, as well as the the tour, tourism ignition fund, uh, as well, that would cover some of this as well uh, when uh, when tourism operators are getting for the summer, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, I can certainly go back to see what uh, programs would be eligible for this and uh, and bring it back to the honourable member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Tom Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I think it would be very helpful to promote that so that businesses know that this is something they can access funding for. But surprisingly, the, this government has not been widely promoting improved ventilation as part of its basic public health guidance, so businesses may not even realize just how important it is. We hardly ever see advice like open a window, for example, alongside other advice like wash your hands. Ventilation is central to the public health guidance that the Public Health Agency of Canada is providing. Question to the Minister of Health. Why is PEI so quiet on the need to use an improved ventilation to protect against COVID? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think you look at uh, the number of initiatives that have been put in place uh, following the directions and following the guidance of our experts in dealing with COVID. Uh, certainly, uh, the, the Honourable Member does uh, reference ventilation. Well, you look at the initiatives that this government that we have taken, for example, throughout our school system to, uh, to improve ventilation. The safety of our students, the safety of all Islanders is always paramount. But with that, Mr. Speaker, yes, we will continue to move forward and we will continue to rely on the advice of the experts as we do move forward. Thank you. Charlottetown Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We appreciate when the government is careful. However, the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure had a little hesitation when contracting with private business Maritime Bus to provide $2 transportation service for Islanders. Pat and the Elephant, a non-profit company providing rides to those living with disabilities, has operated for decades and no research is needed there. Question to the Minister. Why are you hesitating to make Pat and the Elephant able to provide $2 rides for people living with disabilities right now? The Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I've spoken in this uh, legislature previously, uh, we have met with Pat and the Elephant. We are engaged in conversations with them. Uh, we've met with a similar organization in, in Prince County called Transportation West. Uh, we're helping a, a non-for-profit get up and, and going and get a business plan uh, in uh, Kings County called Transportation East. Mr. Speaker, we're certainly looking forward to bring partners to the table that can help grow public transit here on PEI. And Mr. Speaker, not all fares that uh, Pat the Elephant uh, um, um, provides are, are actually charged. There, there's many of them through uh, social development housing clients that uh, to have free access to that service. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last week we heard the emergency $100 $150 that the government committed to qualifying Islanders will not be issued until early July. Mm. Well, to quote the comments the Minister Health just made, their government takes the bull by the horns and gets things done. Oh. Wow. That's not getting things done. Oh, that's right, that's right. You know where the horns go. Mr. Speaker, on March 8th, the price of fuel for an average oil tank was approximately $1,600. Today, that same tank costs approximately $2,100 to fill. Part of the announcement of the emergency supports was to expand the Salvation Army home heating program from $800 to $1,000 annually for maximum assistance and to raise the eligible income threshold, which they did by $5,000. That assistance program has since expired. Question to the Premier. It's been a cold spring and some individuals rely on oil for both heat and hot water heat. Where do Islanders in need of assistance go now? Will you commit to further expansion of this program? Good question. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, it is a good question, and yes, we will commit to expanding that program, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I mentioned, the income threshold for the expansion of the Salvation Army Home Heating Program only rose by $5,000 for each category, meaning two individuals working minimum wage would still not qualify for this funding. Question to the Premier. How many additional people did this program really help, and why was and still is no support for lower middle class islanders? The Honourable Premier. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, we've obviously had to agree to disagree on whether there are not, or in his words, no supports for low or middle income islanders. Mr. Speaker, we are working hard to try to do as very much as much as we possibly can, Mr. Speaker, to help those to shield them from uh, events uh, worldwide that are uh, being inflicted upon us here in PEI through no fault of anybody here. Uh, we have the Minister of Social Development and Housing for the last uh, four or five weeks who has been looking at every single program that his staff offers, looking to how we can change uh, some of the parameters around that to expand them, to include more islanders within that. Mr. Speaker, uh, and as we have done with the other crisis we have dealt with, uh, be it COVID, be it potato wart, now cost of living, the crisis we're dealing with now, we will respond, Mr. Speaker, because that's what Islanders deserve and that's what our government's responsibility is. We have already responded and will be coming bigger in the days ahead, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Well, that's good to hear because there were some suggestions, suggestions made by our caucus and some by the opposition, which just kind of went on deaf ears. The same individuals we will, we feel are even further will even will feel an even further strange on their finances if the goods and services we rely on continue to skyrocket in in price due to the increased costs for those within our supply chain. And we never got a min an answer from the Minister of Agriculture. He said it's going to be the most expensive crop in the history of the province, but he didn't say what they're going to do to help the agricultural industry. Right. Question to the Premier: Will your government be providing any funding to transportation companies or those in the agricultural industry to ease the burden that will be placed on the consumer due to the rising expenses for these industries? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I guess it would be an important time for me to remind the Honourable Leader of the Opposition that why his caucus was trying to apologize for the Federal Minister of agriculture and trying to point blame elsewhere, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Agriculture and Land, the Premier of Prince Edward Island, this government responded to farmers, Mr. Speaker, immediately and with a record number of investments, Mr. Speaker, to help them get through. So yes, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with the agriculture industry, Mr. Speaker. We'll stand shoulder and shoulder with Islanders, Mr. Speaker, and they can continue to apologize for the shortcomings of Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. And this minister here, he'll put a shoulder to the wheel and help farmers, Mr. Speaker, because that's who he is. Larry Inverness. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The last couple of years now, fee-for-service uh, physicians in PEI have been able to bill for patients' appointments that took place over the phone the same fee that they would charge if they were doing an appointment in person. Mm -hmm. But the phone exams are far less comprehensive, and I'm certainly hearing many complaints about why this continues. Even more concerning was hearing that Health PEI did only one financial audit for fee-for-service physicians uh, was completed in the past year. Question the Minister of Health. When will the phone billing end for fee-for-service physicians? And if your department is going to continue, will there be a change of fees associated with phone billing? Get that the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And actually, uh, an excellent question from the former Minister of Health. I do appreciate him bringing this forward. But certainly, as the former Minister of Health, Mr. Speaker, he would fully realize that a fee-for-service physician is like a private business person. They are under the jurisdiction, certainly, of the Medical Society of PEI. I have heard the same concerns as the Honourable Member has, uh, Mr. Speaker. But uh, as I say, as a uh, former minister, he is very well aware of the limitations that may be in place there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Larry and for that. Responsibility to oversee that we're getting customers and patients are getting a, a prop, an appropriate delivery of service, Mr. Speaker. Ensuring the accuracy of billing for fee for service physician is not only fiscally responsible, but it is necessary to ensure that we're not overspending in the area where we could be spending in other areas of the healthcare system. Question the Minister of Health. How many financial audits will be completed for fee for service physicians in 2022? And I hope it's more than one. Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'll certainly uh, go back uh, to Health PEI and the Medical Society, see what audits are planned. But I do think, I find it very interesting, Mr. Speaker, that the former Minister of Health, that during that dark decade plus two years that we had in health care in Prince Edward Island, that this is the best that he can come up with today. It does. It disappoints me, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Hilarious. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll put my numbers up against their numbers any day of the week, Mr. Speaker. I think Islanders would, would judge uh, appropriately. In Health PEI budget, uh, the Minister significantly increased the funding to the Fee Code Advisory Committee from 250000 to 375000 Question the Minister of Health. What will these funds be used for, and are you redoing the fee codes for a fee code for appointments or virtual appointment schedule? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, uh, we're always open to great ideas. But Mr. Speaker, again, in his preamble, the Honourable Member said that he would put his record up against the record on this side of the House any other any day of the week. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I should just point out one thing, that over a two-year period when the f member was the Minister of Health, the total net recruitment of physicians to this province over a two-year period was five doctors. Mr. Speaker, in the last in the last year, in the last year, Mr. Speaker, the net recruitment has been 19 in half the time. You walk into it, buddy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recently, Statistics Canada released a new census where more than one in five working adults are now nearing retirement in Canada. Home care is a valuable service for Islanders and for seniors who need it. Um, home care plays a key part in our health care system, and we know the demand for this care will be increasing. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. The current budget contains a funding increase of $1.2 million for home care services. How will this extra funding be invested to improve services for, an island for Islanders, and is it enough? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the Honourable Member for uh, the question. Great question. Certainly, uh, you look at, uh, at our seniors. Where do they want to age at? Where do they want to stay at as long as possible? It absolutely is in their own home, Mr. Speaker. That is one of the reasons that, as uh, the Honourable Member mentioned, the increase in the budget uh, this year. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we look at the increase in the budget for home care, and I'll be honest, in partnership with, uh, with the federal government, uh, the increase in the initiatives that we as a government have put forward to enable our seniors to stay in their homes and to provide the supports that enable them to stay in their homes as long as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Cornwall Meadowbanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The census also stated that there are more people now aged 55 to 64 than there are aged 15 to 24. So the wave is coming and it is unavoidable. Investing in home care makes sense because it enhances the quality of the care for the client, it reduces bed pressure in hospitals, and it's an investment in wellness which helps re reduce long-term health costs. Question to the Minister of Health. This year's budget also contains 280,000 for the Better Care at Home initiative. What will this new funding entail? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank the Honourable Member uh, for the question. Uh, it, uh, I guess uh, the name says it all, Mr. Speaker, in that, uh, yes, we want to provide that best care at home, to provide the resources uh, to enable uh, our seniors to stay at home. And it's not just within uh, my Department of Health and Wellness in conjunction with Health PEI, Mr. Speaker. But it is. It's working across department lines as well, uh, such as working in conjunction uh, with the Ministry of Social Development and Housing, such initiatives as uh, the Seniors Independence Program, the expansion of that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Formal Minibanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. These all sound like positive steps, but we need to start now, and we need to be prepared for the future. Question to the Minister of Health. What is the timeline for these new funding to roll out, and do you dis anticipate any difficulties, challenges in rolling these new services out? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the question. Uh, with regard to uh, the challenges, uh, yes, any, uh, any uh, positive initiative does come with challenges, without a doubt. Uh, certainly one of uh, the challenges that we've seen right across the healthcare sector, right across throughout the business community, across the province, across Canada, is human resources, Mr. Speaker. But we look at some of the initiatives that we have taken within healthcare to, uh, to improve and to build upon uh, the great frontline staff and home care staff that we do have working 
And uh, yes, there will be challenges, but we're up to the challenge in this side of Harris. Thank you. Charlottetown Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A lot of my conversations as of late have been dealing with traffic, especially in the district that I represent. Now, some of the research I've done, Mr. Speaker, a government website has a map of the provincial highway network, and it displays the average daily traffic counts for traffic data collected on the major roads right across PEI. Now, the area that I represent includes parts of Route 2, or the arterial highway, through the growing area of Winslow, connecting onto the bypass. Now, traffic data showed that in 2020, this section of highway saw an average daily traffic count of nearly 13,000 vehicles, which was similar to pre-pandemic 2019. Question to the Minister of Transportation. How does this traffic data collected inform traffic planning decisions that your department makes? Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, obviously the uh, the data that we mine uh, is integral in our decision making. Uh, uh, we do have a five-year capital plan in in my department for uh, major uh, highway construction, and Mr. Speaker, uh, we use that data to best determine um, what we need to do to improve uh, not only traffic flow but uh, safety for the travelling public as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Winslow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, the last few years have seen significant infrastructure upgrades to the access points feeding the capital city of the province uh, from East Royalty, Cornwall, Stratford. Now, there have been safety improvements, added capacity to those areas, as well as active transportation routes added. Now, the area of my district that I spoke about is seeing increases in residential, institutional, as well as commercial development. And it seems like it is going to continue for the foreseeable future. My question to the Minister of Transportation. What long-term plans are in place for this section of highway feeding into our capital city? Transportation infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, again, it's it's hard to determine what long-term plans there are until we know uh, of all the developments that are, that are happening, uh, particularly subdivisions. And uh, one of the uh, uh, subdivisions the honourable members has spoken about here in the legislature before, uh, everybody just really found out about it a couple of weeks ago. But Mr. Speaker, certainly as a, as a department of transportation infrastructure, working with the city of Charlottetown, we'll continue to work together uh, as well with our federal partners to secure funds to improve highway access uh, here on PI. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate that, Minister. Um, you know, the increased development is continuing, and the better access to public transit as well as active transportation will be needed to go along with any of the safety and the capacity improvements in the area. I had a recent conversation with a lot of the residents as well as bike-friendly communities, uh, and they think there is a desire to have that long-term transportation plan for the Winslow area developed. Um, I do appreciate you being uh, very forward on this and meeting, but my question to the Minister of Transportation, will you commit to having your department and develop that long-term plan as part of your five-year plan for the Winslow area that will improve access for public transit, active transportation, as well as the improved or the increased capacity. Transportation infrastructure. 100 percent yes. Thank you. <laughs> Summerside Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, I have a family in need of legal assistance, and they found out yesterday that they make too much money to qualify for legal aid, despite the fact that they are on income support. Question to the Minister of Justice. Are we ready to address the fact that the threshold for legal aid is completely out of touch with the needs for Islanders? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, it's, a, it's unfortunate we have to have a threshold, Mr. Speaker, but it, it, uh, it's a threshold that we are reviewing now, Mr. Speaker. And if I can make changes, I will. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Summer Mr. Speaker, as the cost of living skyrockets, everything becomes out of reach, including accessing justice. If Islanders can't afford legal counsel and don't qualify for legal aid, they self-represent, which slows things down in court and means worse outcomes for Islanders. To the same minister, is that your vision for legal service on PEI? Honourable Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, cost of living is skyrocketing, Mr. Speaker, and so. Uh, so is everything, Mr. Speaker, and we have. I, I will expedite the process of the review, Mr. Speaker, and see if we can make ch changes sooner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Summerside Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, the minister told us he'll be bringing in a vulnerable persons lawyer, which is what legal aid is supposed to be anyway. So I'm looking for details on this. To the same minister, what is the income cutoff going to be for this minister or for this lawyer? And will income support clients make too much money to get access to the vulnerable persons lawyer? The Honorable Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We, uh, I can't wait for the uh, budget to be officially passed, Mr. Speaker. So I think the vulnerable lawyer on this island will be a great asset to uh, society. It won't necessarily work around uh, financials, Mr. Speaker, but it will 
focus on the most vulnerable islanders across this island, Mr. Speaker, so we can uh, get fair and equitable access to justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Summerside Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, it sounds like the vulnerable persons lawyer is going to be able to work on different issues than the rest of legal aid and for different financial barriers. So a question to the same minister. Is there a reason that you're hiring one person to do this instead of just expanding what legal aid covers in the first place? Honorable Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our legal aid system focuses on criminal and family matters, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we want the vulnerable lawyer to uh, broaden that scope, Mr. Speaker, so uh, we can have fair and equitable uh, justice for vulnerable islanders, Mr. Speaker, because that's important to us. Thank you. Summerside Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, I worry the Attorney General is underestimating how many people are in need of legal support. A question to the same minister. How is the vulnerable person's lawyer one person set up for success when there are so many islanders who are in need of this support? Honorable Minister, Justice and Public Safety. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I'm quite pleased that we are bringing a vulnerable lawyer, Mr. Speaker. If that office expands, I, I, we will expand it if the need is there, Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I'm happy uh, that we can bring this now, Mr. Speaker, because it's important, and uh, I think this government uh, shows the importance of access to justice, and we will support this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Summerside Wilmot, final question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If this is all rolled into one person, you need someone who is familiar with racial issues, you need someone who is familiar with family law, you need someone who is familiar with tenancy issues, you're looking for a unicorn, and even if you find that person, you are <laughs> expecting them to work all by themselves and meet the needs of all islanders. To the yeah. same minister, <laughs> this feels like an attempt to a communication solution to a policy problem. How is this a better fit than just expanding the scope of legal aid? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd love to have the uh, conversation with the member uh, to further this discussion, Mr. Speaker. But uh, a vulnerable lawyer is someone that is a broader scope than legal aid, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we'll continue to support our legal aid uh, department, Mr. Speaker, as well as our, our, our vulnerable lawyer and Mr. Speaker, and perhaps it can start of something great here on this island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of question period. Statements by ministers. The Honorable Minister for Education, Lifelong Learning, and the Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Throughout time, countless women have played an essential role in shaping our province and advancing Canadian society. Mr. Speaker, today is a significant moment in history. May 3rd, 2022 marks the centennial of some women winning the right to vote here on Prince Edward Island. After years of lobbying and advocating by island suffragettes, it was Miss Cecile Stewart who challenged the provincial government of the day in 1922, demanding them to give all island women the right to vote. Non-Indigenous women were granted that right on May 3rd, 1922, 100 years ago today. Yet, it wasn't until the 1960s that these rights were extended to First Nations women. Mr. Speaker, we have come a long way in the past 100 years. Hilda Ramsey became the island's first ever woman candidate in 1951. Since that time, 32 women have been elected to the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island. In 1993, we had PEI's famous five who held the most influential positions of government. And I'm so proud that we have a portrait of these five tremendous women gracing the wall here in the Legislative Assembly. I want to thank those that paved the way for women in Prince Edward Island, that our vote matters on election day, that our names can be on the ballot, and that we can be leaders and change makers for Prince Edward Island. Over the past 100 years, we have made progress, but there is still so much work to be done. This Legislative Assembly has 27 members, yet only seven of us are women. Prince Edward Island women are smart, they're capable, and qualified for elected office. In order for Prince Edward Island to achieve meaningful change, women must be present at our decision-making tables. Women representing diverse backgrounds and cultures that will help shape our future as a province. I commend all of the women's organizations who advocate and promote women's rights and equality. PEI Coalition for Women in Government, the Advisory Council on the Status of Women, Women's Institutes, PEI Business Women's Association, the Women's Network, the Aboriginal Women's Association, L'Association des Femmes Acadiennes et Francophones, and so many others. 
Thank you for your dedication and your leadership. Opening this summer and throughout the remainder of the year, the Foundation will host a traveling photo ex exhibition detailing the past 100 years of women in Prince Edward Island. It will feature experiences and stories from white, Acadian, and Mi'kmaq women and their unique journeys to the ballot box. Mr. Speaker, I hope that 100 years from now, Islanders will look back and see this is a time of women empowerment, working towards closing the gender gap, expanding opportunities, and breaking through the glass ceiling. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as we've established, it's been 100 years since white women in Canada won the right to vote. So let's take a moment to celebrate that while remembering that it wasn't until the 1960s that our first that First Nations Indigenous women got the vote, and then in, be, in between there, of course, were um, Asian women and Black women as well. So to celebrate the privilege that has come um, with that vote, in celebrating, there are lots of things that are not lost on me as we think about this day. Days like today are a mix of emotions, a mix of excitement, and a mix of overwhelmedness, I will say, at all the work that's left to be done. And so while we're celebrating today, there's four things that are not lost on me. First of all is the person's case, where women had to go to court to fight to get a constitutional ruling to establish women as persons under the law. That was in 1929. This one's tough, Mr. Speaker. It was not until 1983 that marital rape was made illegal in Canada. 1983, I was six years old. Women had to go to court to win the right to say no because we were considered property to be done with as men pleased. The third thing, Mr. Speaker, is hearing the U.S. Supreme Court potentially voting to overturn the Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion nationally in the U.S. And the last one I'll mention today, but certainly not the last of a long list of work we still have left to do, is the fact that women in this province did not gain their right to full health care until 2017 and only after a court challenge. Mm -hmm. It seems that many of the privileges that we as women and gender diverse islanders face today has been brought forward with a fight, challenging things in court. So, Mr. Speaker, um, you know, while we've had the right to vote um, for the last hundred years, that's a win. And so, yes, let's take a moment to enjoy that, but then let's roll our sleeves and keep fighting. We need to ensure, as was mentioned by, by the minister uh, responsible for the status of women, you know, there's seven of us in here. That's not good enough. And there's seven women in here. What about um, the members from the LGBTQIA plus community? What about members from our BIPOC community? We talk about representation mattering. That matters. Mm -hmm. We need to fight for them. So, you know, let's celebrate 100 years of white women um, winning the vote. Let's recognize that privilege. And now let's roll up our sleeves and continue the hard work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The honorable member from Charlottetown West Riding, third party house leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister, and thank you to the member from Charlottetown Victoria Park about speaking to this, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad this is, a, this is an important day. It's an important day in history, and as, as, you, as you mentioned, there's, there's major, major gaps and there's places that we still need to go. On May 3rd was just the first step of many down a path we're still traveling, and I think that that does mean that, you know, federally, Indigenous women weren't able to vote, indigenous people weren't able to vote to 1960, and then in 1963, PEI adopted that. Uh, that that's too, that's, that's so, that's not long ago. And we have to remember, we need people, we need women in this chamber that, that represent greater indigenous communities, um, black communities. They've never been in this chamber. They've never been here. And I want to say that I'll do whatever I can possibly to make sure we get people um, women to be in this chamber because we're a better place with diversity and I think that's the next major challenge that we all need to come together and face. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of Minister Statements. Presenting and receiving petition. 
tabling of documents. The Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Mr. Speaker, person to rule 110-9 of the rules of the Legislative Assembly, Prince Edward Island, I'm pleased to respond on behalf of government to the recommendations made by the Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth. And I move, seconded by the Minister of Social Development and Housing, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shirley Carey. Yeah. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, Public Safety, and Eternal General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By command of Her Honor, the Lieutenant Governor, I beg to table Justice and Public Safety Annual Report for the period ending 2020 to 2021. And I am moved by the and move and second by the Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier that this said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shirley Carey. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, by command of the Lieutenant Governor, uh, I beg to le leave to table uh, the budgetary handouts for 2022, and I move second by the Honorable Premier that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Did I miss anyone? Reports by committees, introduction of government bills, government motions. Orders of the day, Governor. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honorable Premier that the first order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Sure. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honorable Premier that this House do now resolve itself in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration grant of supply to Her Majesty. Shall I carry? Sure. The Honorable Member from Tignesh Palmer Row to chair the Committee of the Whole House, please.
committee is now in, or sorry, the House is now in the committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supply to Her Majesty. Honourable members, we are on page 160, the Legislative Assembly. Page 160. Legislative services, appropriations provided for costs associated with the general functioning of the clerk's office, the speaker's office, and the operation of the sessions of the legislature. Administration 194,500, equipment 197,500, material supplies and services 432,800, professional services 30,000, salaries 2,201,200, travel and training 65,000, total legislative services 3,121,000. Shall the section carry? Government Member's Office. Appropriations provided for costs associated with the Government Member's Office. Paid from this section are general office expenses, telecommunications, salaries for caucus staff, and MLA expenses not covered by the Legislative Services. Operations, 446,000. Total Government Member's Office, 446,000. Shall the section carry? Opposition Member's Office. Appropriations provided for costs associated with the Opposition Member's Office. Paid from this section are general office expenses, telecommunications, salaries for caucus staff, and MLA expenses not covered by the Legislative Services. Operations, 564,000. Total Opposition Member's Office, 564,000. Shall it carry? Third Party Office. Appropriations provided for costs associated with the Third Party Office. Paid from this section are general office expenses, telecommunications, salaries for caucus staff, and MLA expenses not covered by the Legislative Services. Operations, 312,100. Total third party office, 312,100. Shall it carry? Amen. Total legislative services, 4,443,100. Shall it carry? Amen. Members, appropriations provided for payment of remuneration to members of the Legislative Assembly, including basic indemnity, expense allowance, and additional honoraria as determined by the Indemnities and Allowances Commission. Administration 15,000, salaries 2,510,800, travel and training 140,000, total members 2,665,800. Shall it carry? Total members 2,665,800. Shall it carry? Office of the Child and Youth Advocate. Appropriations provided for the support of the Office of the Child and Youth Advocate in accordance with the Child and Youth Advocate Act. Administration 22,200, equipment 10,000, material supplies and services 26,500, professional services 75,000, salaries 896,100, travel and training 15,200. Total Office of the Child and Youth Advocate 1,045,000. A leader of the opposition. Just, uh, I know this office is now in its second second year, and um, it's it, it's gone through a, a, lot, a lot of some pretty serious uh, stuff in that time. And uh, I'm just wondering whether the staffing uh, uh, staffing of the office is adequate. And a, a second question about uh, whether there's anybody on staff there who specifically. Um, in place to do child's rights impact assessments. I don't. I don't know about your second question, but I do know that this year they are looking for two additional positions, which I think was would address their where they were short. I think before with the amount of work that they're doing. Um, but I can certainly bring that back. Leader of the opposition. Thanks. I appreciate that. I just want to take a moment to thank um, all of the clerks, all of the legislative staff here that keep this place running and keep us on the straight path, whether that's in the AV section or here in the House or a, a, a legislative support doing research on our behalf. Uh, a big thank you to all the legislative staff. Do you have a question? No. <laughs> Uh, shall the section carry? Okay. Total Office of the Child and Youth Advocate, 1,045,000. Shall it carry? Okay. Office of the Conflict of Interest Commissioner. Appropriations provided in support of the provisions contained in the Conflict of Interest Act. Salaries, 53,000. Travel and training, 3,200. Total Office of the Conflict of Interest Commissioner, 56,200. Shall it carry? Okay. Total Office of the Conflict of Interest Commissioner, 56,200. Shall it carry? <laughs> Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner. Appropriations provided for costs of carrying out the duties of the Office of the Information and Privacy Commission in accordance with the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Administration, 8,700. Material supplies and services, 1,600. Professional services, 18,800. Salaries, 424,000. Travel and training, 5,000. Total Office of Information and Privacy Commissioner, 458,100. Leader of the third party. Explain that a little bit. 
those were um, those jumps represent two additional positions, and that was really to deal with uh, the uh, the increase the increase in amount of cases and uh, orders that the the commissioner is dealing with. Leader of the third party. That's good. Thank you. Okay. Leader of the opposition. Thanks. Uh, along those lines, uh, I know there's been an increase in the demands of this office, and uh, I believe the two new positions that we're just referring to here. Um, or as a direct result of that. So any sense, Joey, is how long it may take for that to actually deal with the backlog that we have? Um, I, I don't. I, I know that she's, uh, the, the commissioner herself is in, is in a hurry to, to put it to, uh, to, to get those dealt with, but she needs to first um, put the competition out to hire these people. Uh, so I, I would... Without having spoken to her, I, I'm not sure, but I know she's. Her plan is to move as quickly as she can. Sure. Leader of the opposition. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. And uh, that office does really important work in, in terms of the integrity of this place. And I look forward to seeing those new positions in place and and the timeline on uh, on the work that comes through their office being reduced. To, I, I know for them it's difficult when they have to put stuff on the back burner or they just simply can't do it at any moment in time. So. I think this is a really important hire and hires rather, and I look forward to seeing them. I, I don't have a question. Thanks. Shall a section carry? Yeah. Total yeah. Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, 458,100. Shall it carry? Yeah. Office of the Ombudsperson and Public Interest Disclosure Commissioner. Office of the uh, Ombudsperson and the Public Interest Disclosure Commissioner. Appropriations provided for the operations and support of responsibilities laid out in the Public Interest Disclosure and Whistleblower Protection Act and the Ombudsperson Act. Administration 25,000, equipment 30,000, material supplies and services 75,000, professional services 55,000, salaries 550,000, travel and training 15,000. Total Office of the Ombudsperson and the Public Disclosure Commissioner 750,000. Leader of the Opposition. This is a brand new office, of course, so uh, any time you spin off a budget for the first year of a new office, it's, there's going to be a certain, uh, certain amount of guesswork going on here. Um, but, so a couple of questions. One is, uh, when, you know, in the creation of this office, is any, does any of this budget that we, we see, the budget lines here, reflect costs associated with the actual setting up of that office? Yes. So um, there is a large, I think, on the order of thirty thousand dollars in material supplies and services that are, that have to do with one-time costs, uh, there's also a significant portion of the equipment costs that are one-time costs for computers and things like that, printers, um, and I think I believe that that is the bulk of the one-time costs associated with the office. Leader of the opposition. Thanks. And again, I realize that uh, you know we're budgeting seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We really have no sense of how much traffic is going to go through this office. Um, but do we, you know, I guess as with all of these offices, the, the opportunity to scale it up as necessary um, would exist. Uh, through legislative management, and I'm privileged to sit, sit on that. So d is there any, any sense looking at how other ombuds offices that have been established in other provinces whether the, the you know our the budget that we've allocated here given our our population is going to be sufficient for what we anticipate the workload to be i think I d discussing with um the uh, the ombudsperson sandy hermiston and really just the interest the public interest that's been in the office since she was appointed last fall um that i think she feels like this is an appropriate amount to start with and then see where it but basically she the the I guess inquiry started last fall, and we were in a holding period, of course, because she right. wasn't in the position yet. Uh, and my understanding, I spoke with her the other day, she's dealing with about 30 complaints, and the, really the office has not even started, really. She's in, she's in setup mode to get the office running. So um, by all, you know, I, I think this is sufficient for now, and I think that, you know, if she needs to come back to the Standing Committee on Legislative Assembly Management, then she'll be able to do that. Right. Leader yeah. of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. And I realize that, you know, obviously the passing of this budget and the approval of the funding is going to be a critical thing, but when, when do you anticipate that the office will be fully up and running? She is, she is in currently in the process of hiring two staff, and I think when she has those two people in place that she'll be able to start dealing with uh, the, the complaints that she's, she's received. 
Leader of the Opposition. I'm good, thanks, Chair. Shall a section carry? Carry. Total off is the Ombuds person and the Public Interest Disclosure Commissioner, 750000 Shall it carry? Carry. Elections PEI. Elections. Appropriations provided for all operational costs associated with the Elections Office. Administration, 16700 Equipment, 2800 Material supplies and services, 12000 Professional services, 10000 Salaries, 361300 Travel and training, 10500 Total elections, 413300 Leader of the third party. Explain the salaries here, please. And like, is this due with the municipal election that's happening this fall, or is this an ongoing? S some of it would be in there, but, but this was uh, mostly, um, these were just um, salary increases based on step increases and other um, increases in the, uh, in some of the mandatory um, reductions in salary, so like things like CPP and EI and things like that that weren't adjusted for in previous years. Leader of the third party. So there really isn't a announcement here for the fall election? There's, there, there are no new staff, no. Thank Leader you. The third, okay. Mermaid Stratford. So um, I'm just curious about the municipal elections coming up, and um, I know at some point here we're going to be talking about school board elections, and this morning I had heard school board elections will be October, municipal elections will be November. Is there additional cost to the office that would be encompassed here, or is that, is that factored in, in another way? So um, with, uh, and I would imagine that the school board elections will be the same, but the municipal elections, the, the basically elections PEI facilitates the election. They incur the cost initially, but then they bill everything back to the municipality. So it's, it's a wash, essentially. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And so would that be the same case for the school board? They would bill it back to the school board then? Or how does that work? Or is it because I, we I, haven't I don't know it, for don't sure, know but yet? I would imagine I, I, in speaking with the uh, chief electoral officer, he hasn't indicated to me that there be any additional costs. They would be, I would imagine, billing it back to the department. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Okay. And the coming into effect of the Municipal Government Act has set more formal processes for municipal elections. and that all municipalities need to follow. So how does elections PEI, how are they affected by this? Like, do, will they be conducting the municipal, these, the elections for all the municipalities in the province, or is that cost up to the communities? I'm, I'm not, I'd have to bring that back, I'm not sure. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. No, that's fine, Chair. I'm just curious as to how that whole process works. Shall the section carry? Total elections PEI, 413,300. Shall it carry? Total Legislative Assembly, 9,831,500. Shall it carry? Sure. Chair, I want to say a few words just before we, uh, we close. <coughs> you know, members, the Legislative Assembly had 81 committee meetings and 51 sitting days with 53 bills passed. So at this time, I'd like to thank the staff, not only the frontline staff you see every day, but, but the staff behind the scenes that make all this happen for us. And, you know, virtual proceedings, this is the first time ever we had virtual proceedings. So the staff really make, like, they bend over backwards to make sure everything is running smoothly. Like, what we think will happen in five days, they can make it happen in two and a half days, half the time. They work overtime and they really go overboard to uh, make our uh, legislature work. So at this time, I'd just like to thank the staff from all, all over the Legislative Assembly. Look, we see the frontline people, right? But there's a lot of people behind the scenes that uh, we don't see and don't get thanked. But I'd like to thank them too. That's good, Chair. Okay, we're uh, honourable members. We are on page 167, the Auditor General, page 167. 
Administration, appropriations provided for the operational costs in conducting audits and other examinations. Administration, 40,700, equipment 18,000, material supplies and services 44,100, professional services 70,000, salaries 2,907,500, travel and training 44,700, grants 6,500, total administration 3,131,500. Somerset Wilmot. But I do know that the AG's office in the past has indicated they were having some difficulty recruiting auditors. I see that there's been an increase in the salary line. Should I take that to assume that that's been addressed? I think they are still having some challenges, but I know they're looking for three additional positions this year. Um, and I think he's had better luck, but it still is, they're, they're still finding uh, the, the people he's looking for has been a challenge. Yeah, sure. Somerset Woman. Thank you, Chair. And I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, and if you can't, that's okay. But I just wonder if you know if they're still intending to do their special COVID audits or if they're returning to their normal schedule. Uh, I think they, if they have outstanding COVID audits, they were going to continue doing them. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Okay, you're welcome. Shall the section carry? Carry. Total Auditor General, 3,131,500. Shall it carry? No, that was my, I, it wasn't on my list of uh, uh, to do, so we just caught it. Members, we are now going to the Department of Finance on page 86. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Would you please uh, state your name and position for Hansard? Uh, Vicki Hamilton, uh, Chief Financial Officer, Department of Finance. Thank you very much, Vicki, and welcome. Administration general appropriations provided for operation of the ministers and the deputy ministers' offices. Administration, 9,900. Equipment, 1,500. Material supplies and services, 13,500. Professional services, 2,500. Salary, 691,300. Travel and training, 56,200. Total general, 774,900. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, nice to see you. Um, under the general section, I um, wanted to ask just some questions about some of the things that we've talked about that are sort of about general management for finance. One of the primary ones is around the need for us to review how we do this estimates process. It's been raised a number of times in committee. I know the Premier's spoken to it. We've spoken about it. Um, and I understand there's been a lot of other things going on, but can you give us any indication of where we're, whether, where your department is at with thinking about how to address that or how we can maybe do the system differently? Um, so we are we, we have had that discussion and sometimes it does get pushed to, to the back burner but we are bringing in a policy person in the department to help us with uh, you know different issues that have come up and we just don't have anyone in the department to we don't have the manpower to do that so uh, hopefully with this policy person we'll be able to deal with that and a number of other issues Charles sure, Belvedere okay I look forward to the, the discussion on that hopefully we can be looped in on that as a you know, yeah. willing participant. Mm -hmm. um, I do. I do know that you've got um, an, uh, 120 thousand dollars in additional new salaries. Is that part of the that need of needing the additional policy analysis work? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cheryl Town Belvedere. Obviously, you know, Minister. I, I, you know, I think it's really important that we have that resource available to you because I know the pressures on the department have been extensive. There's a lot of balls in the air, so it's a good investment to mm -hmm. make if it means that we can change systems. Um, one of the other things we've asked about, and it may be on the radar there, is um, whether there's ever a cost-benefit analysis done for um, at the financial management level when we talk about new programs or about substantive changes to programs like, you know, we're going to do an overhaul of social assistance. Are we looking at the cost-benefit analysis of that and, and opportunity costs and sort of how that looks like from a financial management perspective as well as a program perspective? Well, I would say any, any changes to uh, social programs would be through social development housing. So we'd work with, with the CFO there to ensure that, you know, they are looking at cost-benefit analysis, analysis. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you brought that up with the minister when he was on the floor. So, yeah. yeah. 
Charlotte Ann Belvedere. Thank you. And the reason for asking is particularly with something like social programs and many of the other large-scale public and social infrastructure programs is that there's some negotiation also required with our federal counterparts, which may not necessarily only happen at the department level, but would happen at the Treasury Board or finance level, which would bring you and your staff into play. So it's thinking about that this doesn't sit in isolation in the department. So, you know, we have extensive... Um, transfer, federal transfer specifically allocated for social development and housing projects, including housing and other pieces. Um, and so if we're going to make substantive changes here at the policy level, how is that reflected in terms of the negotiations at the federal level? And how, you know, and what, what does that look like from the from the policy yeah. approach? We'll definitely take that into consideration too. And, and uh, I am looking forward to, the, to this new person coming on board to deal with a lot of the issues we haven't really had the time to, to dig into, yeah. and that'll be one of them. Yeah. Charles on Belvedere. Thank you. And I'm sure this is something that's come up probably even more so with COVID because of that massive overlap of, of programming from a federal through and then the accounting back. I know that that has been something we've talked about in public accounts as well. Yeah. So. Um, the, when we had um, Environment, Energy and Climate Action on the floor, they had said that um, regarding the carbon tax revenue and associated gas tax caps and so on would be accounted for in finance. Can you just let me know what section that would come under so I can ask in the appropriate section? Well, it's actually in the revenues, which isn't part of the expenditure okay. review, but if you have any specific questions on the revenues, I can try and answer them for you. Okay. At Charles Helm Belvedere. So when, when would I be able to ask um, this? Well, you, you can now. Do now. We, we don't debate the revenues, so. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Sorry, Chair. Sure. Yeah, thank you, and I, I appreciate that. It's, it's a bit of a challenge. Obviously, it's, it's, it's been kind of bumped a number of times, and, it, and I appreciate that it's a very difficult space. We also have the opportunity when the legislation is on the floor, but we've also been told to ask an estimate. So we just don't want to be in a situation where we're going in circles about when we should have asked. And if it means it is something that we will specifically discuss in the legislation, that also that also works, as I appreciate the nuance of revenue to, to expenditure. Um, I mean, I do have very specific questions that I will be asking when we come to bring that, that bill back to the floor minister. Um, and, I'm, and I'm fine with asking those, those there, if we can have that discussion at that point. That well, and I will answer what I can. You I know, appreciate that. Because, you know, we are not... We're not spending the money. We're just bringing yeah. it in, and, and you know, it'll be dispersed through environment. So. I mean, in terms Cheryl of the direction from the chair, the other aspect of that is, you know, in, in the in the limitation of needing to ask questions that connect to a, a line item in the budget, it makes it very difficult. Whereas, in the when we have legislation on the floor, we can talk more about policy and policy decisions, and that would be the place. If that if that we could kind of agree on that, then that would mean we can move through this other piece here. Okay. okay. Then I would be uh, fine at that section, chair. Leader of the third party. Thank you. In the first section there, in, in the salaries, the details of the salaries under the general section there shows uh, the highest point of salaries at, at 449, leaving a 241 unaccountable for what you have on your line in your book. Could you explain that? So under the first section of administration, mm -hmm. Uh, the salary totals are uh, the new estimate, 6913, mm -hmm. 551.8 for the forecast, and 571.1 for the budget. So you want the variance, the well, forecast when you add it up, variance? When or? you add it up on the, on the briefing book we got, it comes to 449.38. So, like the five positions, so the, the difference is 241,000. So, why is there a difference there of that much? I'm not sure where your numbers, sorry, I'm not, the, the numbers that are published are 691.3, mm -hmm. 551.8, yep. and 571.1. Okay, and in our handbook, we got the deputy minister, one position, between 125 and 190, planning, po policy planning and regular regulation manager, one. Yes. With a variance of 71 to 89. Yes. And then the policy development officer, 60 to 74. Administrative assistant, 50 to 60. There's two. Oh, yes. Sorry. So there's two okay. of Okay. I understand what you're asking now. My apologies. Um, so there is a, an executive assistant position, but it's not a permanent position. So that's, that doesn't get listed in the position posting for your handout, as well as the new position that the minister referenced for policy 
the position hasn't been created yet so the budget dollars are here but we don't have a, a position number for it yet so that's why it's not in your position handout so we're being asked to approve a budget with lines that aren't actually there so the handout uh, for salaries is for uh, permanent positions within the Public Service Commission. So if there's casual dollars associated with the salaries, they get picked up in the budget, but they're not part of the salary handout. Okay. Could I ask the Minister a question? Like, when I look at the Minister of Social Development and Housing, his are all totals. There's the you know, first step and the last step, and there's the total, which, as I pointed out, they're quite at a whack. How come yours aren't totaled? Like, why aren't these sections totaled? In, in your handout? In my handout, yeah. Um, well, the, we could, I guess. There's people that are in different ranges, so it is just a range of... of compensation. Of compensation, compensation that the totals really could fall anywhere in between on those ranges. And um, I guess our package before, we had never been advised to total them, so I guess some CFOs have done it a little bit differently, but... We can certainly look at that. I, I, I don't know how much value it would give you as it's a total of a large range where any of the salaried employees could fall within those ranges. Well, when I look, well, thank you, Chair. Can I ask another question, Chair? Go ahead. <laughs> so when I look at the social development housing, when I add them up at the top end of the salary range, which people are not at, or you can't tell us for confidentiality, the difference between the top up and the first step in one case is a half a million dollars. So I'm being asked to approve a budget of uh, an additional half a million dollars that's not there or can't be entered for. So that's what my concern is in this section, like the 190, the 89, the 74, and the 60. If that totals 449 and we're expected to pass a budget of 691, it should be in there where that other $240,000 is. Um, we can certainly look at how the presentation is for the handouts that are given. I guess the instructions to the CFOs in preparing that book f for you was to list the, the permanent positions that have a number through Public Service Commission. And some departments might not have temporary dollars and some do, and I guess that's where this discussion comes in for us to explain beyond those uh, classified positions what other type, types of things are in there, like the executive assistant or a, a temp pol policy person or what have you. One more question, Chair. So would it not be possible for your finance people in each department under general, without knowing to us what level the deputy minister is at, that they know that and they put the amount in your total instead of having an amount that's at the high end? Um, we can certainly take it back to the, the budget group and discuss to have a better presentation for next year, for sure. Thank you. Cheryl Hound Brighton. Thank you. I had a question about uh, paying out money to Ireland. As I understand that, you know, printing out the 100,000 checks or whatever it is and checking the tax record and all that is no, it's no small job, so I appreciate it. It will take some time, but uh, in the future, we're probably going to see bigger and maybe more often payments of issues like uh, carbon taxes, for instance. Have you, are you considering working with the FETs in some way that enable you to be more flexible? Honorable members, we're having a lot of difficulty hearing. If you want to have a conversation, please take it outside the rail. Thank you. Sir, sorry, Cheryl Dunbrighton, you still have the floor. Have you been, uh, thank you, Chair, have you been uh, looking into ways of sort of making these things hap uh, happen fast, or is it a, is it a matter of uh, the machines that printed out? Or Honourable members, I'm going to ask one more time, and then I'm going to have to take a recess. We are having a lot of difficulty hearing over here. Charlottetown Brighton, I'm sorry about that. Did you get the question? I, 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 I did. Okay. Uh, so we are we are discussing that, honourable member. We are um, we we don't have the mechanism in place provincially to to uh, send out those payments mm -hmm. because the federal government uh, has the you know the banking information and 
all of the information. We would have names and addresses, but we don't have their, you know, ability to see their assessments or um, their banking information. So the, those are the real stumbling blocks that we've got. And since our ability to, to collect taxes now happens federally, you know, <laughs> which we're quite glad to, to let them do that, but it's times like these that, you know, it does create a challenge. And we have had that discussion about how we can do things more efficiently. And, and it would mean a lot of staffing and a lot of hours to, to make that happen. And uh, would take a lot longer, probably take us a year to do what we're trying to do provincially right now because we don't have the manpower, we don't have the mechanisms. So, but we are discussing that. and. We're, we're concerned that, you know, <laughs> the line is and the premier's used it is, it's very difficult to give money away. And, <laughs> you know, we also have to adhere to um, the rules specified in legislation and to ensure that the Auditor General is happy with the fact that we've done our due diligence to make sure that, you know, people who are applying, you know, deserve and, and uh, are in the right bracket for that. So it, it's a challenge. Uh, we had no idea, I think, when we, when we made the announcement that it was going to be the challenge that it is, but we'll continue to you know, look at other ways of doing it. Yeah. Charlotte Ann Brighton. Uh, thank you. I'm good. Hey. Charlotte Ann Belvedere. Thank you. It was just a, a follow up to something um, earlier regarding process in the general section is um, the, the process for submission review and discussion on public submissions to the budget process. You know, when we've had pre-COVID, we could kind of have a better idea of what was happening because we could attend those sessions and hear what people and see the submissions, but that's not the case in a little while. And there have been some concerns that it's less transparent than it could be. Is there, is that, you know, when we talk about reviewing, is that something that we can, we can look at? Because there's definitely been a bit of a gap between what people think they've submitted and what government perhaps knows is submitted and, and, and it's really hard to trace that story. Um, there is actually a, a published report um, on the website for the summary of all the pre-budget consultations that were received. Yeah. Um, and I, unfortunately, the, a summary report, sorry, Chair, but a summary report doesn't help us trace, you know, when I, when we get very specific requests from community groups or community that it, then we need to assist with or we're asked to support. We don't know where it originated, where it went, is the minister available, and it's, it, we've had we've run across it quite a lot in this last last few bits. So um, it's just it's more to bring to your attention, I think, yeah. is, with your indulgence in this section, that there there have been some concerns just about the line of communication. Okay. Um, harder to advocate if the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. So okay. well, thanks for raising that. Thank yeah. you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Debt and investment management appropriations provided to manage the provincial debt, sinking fund, treasuries, operations, and pension fund assets. Administration 7,400, equipment 4,000, material supplies and services 6,000, professional services 112,000, salaries 396,700, travel and training 15,600, total debt and investment management 541,700. Shall the section carry? Carry. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. Um, each year, Cabinet approves via um, order and council the Statement of Investment Policies and Procedures uh, for pension plans. Can you just explain what's included in those policies and procedures? And are you able to table a copy of the statement? I'm, I'm, I'm not positive. I think the policies and procedures are public. Okay. Um, but I will confirm that for you. Could you? Yeah, I had a yeah. bit of a dig and I may not have been using the right okay. language, but yeah, sometimes my Google Foo fails me, so. <laughs> um, I guess th 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 this may be a follow-up question as well, but uh, looking for the percentage of provincial pension funds that are invested in fossil fuels. Uh, I have that for you. Okay. Point one percent. Okay, thank you for that, Chair. Keep going. Oh, thank you. We never stopped before, so keep going. <laughs> well, you know, yeah. there's a courtesy in there. Yeah. I would, I would hate for you to think that I am assuming, Chair. Um, how do, does the province apply um, ESG principles, environmental, social, and governance principles to our investments? Like, what kind of what kind of principles are applied in terms of our investment decisions? Um, I don't have the details on the workings of the the Master Trust okay. Committee, um, but I can certainly bring anything back for you that 
I, I would appreciate that. I think it would be very helpful given some of the other conversations that are happening in, again in other departments. So the ESG principles, environmental, social and governance principles to investments. Um, I guess following on from the same thing around investment management, we've seen volatility in the stock market, obviously, very, very volatile time, pandemic, and now the conflict in Ukraine, and supply chain issues. Are those events affecting our civil service pension and teachers pension plans? Or is, there, is there enough kind of risk management built in to the kind of management of that portfolio? Um, I can say that uh, in February, when things were becoming volatile, uh, we did reach out to uh, all the investment managers uh, inquiring about exposure and um, they had already minimized uh, their risk. Yeah. So um, I guess the this, this specific note is uh, after reviewing the list of direct investments, there is insignificant exposure in global equities, fixed income and real estate with minimal exposure and in infrastructure. Most managers had already decreased their exposure in Russia before the escalation. Thank you, and, and that makes sense that if you know, given that good risk managers are, are, are looking ahead at those those pieces, and could see something coming. So we, we definitely had advanced warning, and I, and I know that generally, I think I discussed this previously with the, the minister, but we generally have a small C conservative approach to our long term investments anyway. Yes. So that would, you know, we're not out there doing major high risk volatile investments. One of the investments, though, that has been um, significant in the, that we've talked about in here and it's been talked about by the Bank of Canada and so on is investment in real estate trusts. Um, can you, do you have any data on how much of our, of our investments are sitting in, um, in, in real, uh, real estate uh, investment trusts? Um, it looks... I have a note here. Canadian real estate... No, that's the... Three percent, it looks like global real estate, five percent, and global infrastructure, five percent. So a total of thirteen percent. Sorry, total. Thirteen. Thirteen. Between total. Canadian, mm -hmm. global, and then global infrastructure. Infrastructure, right? Um, and I recognise, obviously, you know, global infrastructure could be just about anything, and, and there's, you know, and again, long-term investment and long-term capital projects. But the the three percent into REATs, I, I guess, the question would be whether those are commercial or residential. Um, because obviously they, they have very different impacts and profiles in our, in our community. And one of the things we're looking at when we're talking about um, a broader social review of the impact of our investments, in the same way we are about fossil fuels, is the impact of residential trust. So um, I know you wouldn't have that level of granularity, but, but it is something that, that um, is, is on the radar more as we talk about that um, ESG principle. I guess my last question in this section would be just around, obviously, because of circumstances, as previously mentioned, COVID being one of them. Um, I think the Premier spoke about this this morning in his address. We are expecting to run a deficit, at least until the 24-25. Um, do you have any projected date at this point, you know, cautious as it may be, for when we begin to sort of make that corner turn? I mean, I know we're seeing a really robust response right now in, in terms of our, our GDP response and so on. I have many things to say about that, but I'll keep it short. But the gist of it is, is you know, cash flow and 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 um, our economy in terms of those indicators is looking stronger. Well, uh, I feel like I need to touch wood, but <laughs> no, it's like we, we, are, desk. Yeah. we are trying. We are projecting that we will work our way, you know, to, to towards balance in the next three years. Is kind of the where we where we project it, you know, for this budget. But um, you know, <laughs> there are, there are some inflationary pressures right now, so we'll we'll just see. But we are you know we've had the discussion with uh, the bond raiders about how our goal is to get back to to def to a, a balance and wait yeah. and see. I guess you know, that's yeah. Yeah, and I recognise that, that a large chunk of this is, is sort of things that are happening on a global scale, on a federal scale. You know, there's a lot going on again, federal negotiations, all those kind of things, inflation. There's so many pieces in the story, but but it's that that long-term plan. So in terms of the long-term plan from your department, you're looking at that sort of 24, 25. Um, there's great concern that that could mean that we're seeing a potential austerity. 
budget coming in the future? Is that something that you are considering? Well, we haven't really shown that yet as a government. And <laughs> I, I, I feel that, you know, we want to be there for Islanders as much as we can. We, we can't make them whole. And, you know, there are going to be, I, I really feel, some tough times ahead as far as interest rates and, and you know, the pressures around uh, fossil fuels. And um, so, you know, there are no there are no plans right now for any real austerity measures, but we will continue to look at where we are. And I mean, we're we're anticipating a really good tourism season, and you know the the you know economy of the island will do well. But having said that, then you know where are we going to be at with our with our potato growers? So there are a lot of definitely a lot of uh, you know balls in the air. So we'll uh, I, I would say it's definitely a wait and see. And that's and that's fair. I mean, obviously, one of the other aspects of this is is um, the uh, the economy on a tear has has impacts on the co the investments needed for those social and public infrastructure pieces, yeah. and that's where we're seeing that that pressure right now. And so, you know, the argument is we need to be making that investment, and so this isn't the time to be thinking about austerity. It is the time to be investing as much because we have to catch up. Um, and so, you know, that is something that that obviously we look for and we advocate for, um, and I understand different sets of priorities and, and so on, but, the, but that is certainly the balance. Um, and it comes back to, again, what I've spoken about earlier regarding the environmental social governance issues, that, that the financial only are not a, a balance right, in terms I, of taking care of islanders. I hear it every day. <laughs> yeah, so, I'm yeah, sure you do. Yeah, I do. And yeah. we'll keep saying it every day. So. <laughs> well, not um, just from, from the opposition, but from my own uh, yeah, I know. Know, government members as well. And, and uh, you know... Yeah. We, we'll do what we can, and I think we've, we've shown that. There, can we do more? Absolutely. And I think that the pressures on, you know, the, how we, our economy was booming before COVID and the increase in population and, you know, all of that, and then how that trickles down to all departments. And, you know, yes, we need more health care. We need more schooling, you know, schools. We need more daycares, you know. Yeah, it's a lot of pressures. Yeah. Okay, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, leader of the third party. Excuse me, Chair. Still on debt and investment management? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, just another kind of the same line, questioningly. When I add up what you're showing in the book at the high end, it's uh, 270,000 for wages. You got 396,700, 120,000 in the difference. Like, how come that's not in that book? Like, to show us that difference. Uh, there's only the four positions, but beyond those salary ranges, you, you would have your EI, CPP, group life, uh, medical benefits that go on top of every individual that get added into to the salary total. So those ranges are salary ranges, but they don't include the government's uh, benefit expenditure for each employee. So that could be $120,000 for four employees, five employees, four. And that's if they're all at the high end. But you, there's two, there's four employees. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. So you had eighty-nine thousand. So yeah, you're looking at exactly. It. Okay. Yep. All right. My mistake. Okay. No problem. Yep. Shall a section carry? Carry. Pensions and benefits appropriations provided for administration of pension benefit programs, which includes ad, uh, advising employees on a variety of programs, informing government of the financial direction of these programs, and overseeing the costs and delivery of employee benefit packages. Administration ten thousand two hundred equipment four thousand material supplies and services nine thousand six hundred salaries one million three hundred seventy three thousand nine hundred travel and training ten thousand seven hundred total pensions and benefits one million four hundred eight thousand four hundred. Shall the section carry? Total administration, 2725000 Shall it carry? Economic statistics and federal fiscal relations. Appropriations provided for policy advice on federal fiscal manners, matters, including major transfers and tax issues, economic analysis and statistics, and division. the division includes grants for income and sales tax credits and rebates. Administration, 163400 Equipment, 1700 Material supplies and services, 2400 Professional services, 115000 Salaries, 569400 Travel and training, 22000 Grants, 9190000 Total economics, statistics, and federal fiscal relations, 10063900 Charlotte Charlottetown Belvedere. Um, so we have three economists funded under this section, I believe. Um, can you speak about 
the work they do and, and the advice they provide to government in terms of determining tax policy. Um, I could go back to our, I don't have the details of what each person does, but I can look at our annual report that was mm -hmm. published because it does give some details on that section specifically, the kind of things that they do. Okay, Here. well, I, I, then, then that's my my thing to go and look at that. So, okay. so yeah, I'm not going to ask you to, which I sure. will appreciate. I'm not asking you to read that out. Okay. Um, <laughs> I guess my, then my question would be sort of when you do it, when you propose like a tax a tax cut or a tax credit and so on, what kind of analysis um, do we do in relation to those changes? I mean, that you know, I've talked before about cost benefit analysis. So the cost of this, you know, and this is the the return. So the example would be the low and modest income household credit, which is a seven point six five million dollar. Um, credit is part of the grant line here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's the assessment on that in terms of um, th that's an expense? It's a revenue we're no longer generating, right? I get this. So we're, you know, there's an expense. It's showing up as an expense line. How do we assess the impact of that from an economic perspective? Does that, does that happen in the department, or does it happen externally? Um. I don't have the specifics on what kind of review they do or uh, the analysis that was done when that program was set up. I do have the criteria for that here, okay. um, but I don't have the details of, okay. of the work that that section would do specifically to. I guess I guess what I'm asking is you've got you might, you might have a policy commitment or a political commitment or a policy commitment to, to provide a, a tax cut, but then you also do the economic analysis. If we do this, what is the yes. what is the impact? And and that's and it's it's where's the balance again? Balance where's the balance in, in, in that? Because you know so we want to see the tax cuts go to help the, those who most need it. Are we doing assessment that says that that's actually the outcome? Um, definitely, this section would do that type of analysis uh, in consultation, depending on uh, what the bill is proposing with their counterparts mm -hmm. in other provinces or, or the federal government, and then doing those proposals up through management to do an assessment. Okay. So when we do um, the, the, the assessment of tax issues, so I'm also thinking, you know, the other types of tax, tax issues, things like vaping tax. Or, you know, which I think is coming, or tobacco tax changes. Um, does this is this where that analysis would also happen? Because I don't see that in the the line item here. Uh, those would be provincial tax, right? Provincial so taxes. So this is a federal relations one, right? Gotcha. So those would fall under the taxation and property records. Okay. So yep. I so I can speak about those ones. Those ones there. Again, they're they're revenue yeah. driven. Yes. Which again, some <laughs> of that would be brought up through the legislation review that you were right. referring to. Right, and that's to. where we, we discuss it in the bill instead. Right. In this case, then, because it's a federal issue, you'd mentioned earlier about the challenges of, of generating checks. That that these are things where they have to negotiate it. So they're determined internally through that combination of policy, politics, and an economic analysis, and then negotiated federally. To, to to implement? Is that the kind of process? I, I wouldn't say negotiate federally, federally to implement, but if we look at something like a vape tax, if we're going to do that and it's not in line with the federal vape tax or they're not going to collect the vape tax, then again, we would have to have the mechanism in place provincially right. to collect those funds, you know, and, and that's the problem with a lot of, you know, these standalone taxes that we're looking at is do we take the plunge and you know, start collecting tax again on uh, island initiatives, to put it that way. Right. So, yeah. Whereas here we have something like the Volunteer Firefighters Tax Credit, which is a federal initiative that we have to, like, it's, why is it showing up? If, it's, if this is a federal um, fiscal relationship grant, why are and it's, so it's cut it's showing an, up on your federal tax return. Why is it I showing can up explain. here? <laughs> it's, I, am, I am very baffled by that's, this. That's fine. And it's all to do with uh, the proper accounting of okay. a tax credit versus a tax <laughs> refund. Right. So um, if, if the kind of credit that we're giving is cash back, regardless of whether you owe taxes or not, it's considered a grant. Yes. So that's why it's showing up there, whereas other tax credits that you only get a deduction if you have taxes owing, it's a non that gets netted against the revenue. But because people are entitled to this 
if you're a firefighter, you're going to get your $500 or $1,000 check regardless of whether you had taxes owing or not. Yes. It has to show up as a grant just for audit purposes. Okay. I know this is the same case for, for First Nations HST rebates exactly. because it is it is a return of funds that are owed. Exactly. And and in terms of low income household credit, it that is a that is a direct cash reduction. That's thing. right. They'll yes. get that money regardless of whether they have taxes owing okay. or not. Thank you for that. No problem. <laughs> yeah, the, You're not the first one to ask. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, you know, you sort of you try and work it all out, and there's just there are so many different buckets. And the combination of is it, if it, like you said, is it a grant? Is it a refundable? Yeah. Is it a non-refundable? Is it federally delivered, or is it provincially managed but federally charged? Yeah, I, absolutely. We'll go down that rabbit hole for ages. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll so we'll speak about things like the the potential provincial things, the vaping, tobacco, in that other section. Other though. When you're looking at other potential tax policies, and I think the minister mentioned this, if you're considering other potential policies where you're not quite sure where they might land, would you do that discussion here first? So, so for instance, you know, we've talked about a vacancy tax, and, and again, there's a connection there federally. So where does that kind of, again, that analysis happen? Would it be in this section first, in this kind of area? It would be a combination between uh, taxation, so the tax commissioner, um, and our economics section. Mm -hmm. um, work collaboratively all the time to determine the best fit to do jurisdictional scans and look at mechanisms that may already be in place uh, in other jurisdictions yeah. to determine the best way to proceed with implementing or being consistent with rates or whatnot. So although they're different sections, when it comes to tax, tax implications, typically the tax section and the economic section will work very closely together. Which makes complete sense, right? You know, these are not, in the end, these are not necessarily separate buckets, right? We, we have to account for them as separate buckets, which must be a royal, you know what, but, I, but, I, but, but they, are, they are, for all intents and purposes, the same thing. I guess my last question in this section is, is obviously, you know, we've been talking specifically about the rising cost of inflation, cost of living, and so on, and that is also an economics challenge, you know, in a very dry sense, but it is. Is your department looking at that on that kind of broader economic approach. I mean, obviously, it could be through substantive changes to taxation policy, carbon tax is not a piece of that story. There's lots of moving parts. Is that something that you are working on from that kind of strategic level? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's a conversation we're having probably daily on what differences, you know, we could make and then getting our analysts to look at, you know, jurisdictional scans, what other provinces are doing. Uh, yeah, it's, it's always... Top of mind, I would say, especially right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, is that anything that you would be willing to discuss or share? <laughs> At some point. Okay. Yeah. At some point. With, with or without a press release. <laughs> um, I lied. Last question. Sorry, I didn't like. I would miss miss out. Um, the the emergency funding. When you come out with something like an emergency fund, that twenty million, which encompasses a number of different programs, is that entirely federal, uh, provincial dollars? And if so, where does it come from? Is it going to be a special warrant, or is it because it wasn't in the budget as we've as we've been reviewing here? Not really sure where that shows up. So we do have under general government, which the section we'll get to later. Yeah. So that's where our big bucket of contingency funds right. resides. So big um, bucket of contingency funds. I love that. <laughs> um, well, it is, it is for unforeseen yes. things. So uh, as an example, that announcement was made after the budget was set. Yes. So there are funds available within the contingency, and as the year progresses, if, if there aren't sufficient buckets in the contingency funds to cover those new unforeseen uh, expenditures, then we would return for a special warrant at that point in time. Because, it, because in general government right now, you, you, unless, well, you just don't, you don't have enough to cover that, given the other buckets that are already allocated. So we're, I ex I'm expecting we're going to need to see a special warrant very soon, because you've already exceeded your capacity of your general government big bucket right now with that, with that announcement. Well, we have the, the COVID contingency mm -hmm. and the potato contingency, right. and then there's a general other salary negotiations, other contingencies. Yeah, so, yeah, so. so your total is 40 million, yeah. and I went out there yet, but, but thinking, I was thinking that the potato industry wouldn't be available for this, because it's not salary, like it's, a, it's not potato industry. Anyway, we'll talk about that when we get there, but sure. yeah, just a bit concerned about that we've already gone blown through our, our big bucket, so. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm good there, thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Leader of the third party. 
uh, federal f physical regulations? Yep. Okay. So just just back to my same line of questioning. So there's five hundred sixty nine thousand four hundred dollars there for wages, but when you add up the five people, it's considerably less. It's four fifty five. So you're looking at about one hundred and fourteen thousand dollars in the difference. What did you say that difference would be? So there is one temp uh, that's not on your list because they're not a PSE position within that. Um, and then the other uh, employer benefits would be uh, EI, CPP, group life, and medical. Okay. So the reason why I ask this again is when, and I know I'm going ahead here, but I'm not getting into details going ahead, but on page 90, where it's got employee benefits, you've got some benefits that you just mentioned there. So that's why I'm confused. Like, So those would be on the pension payments, not on the salaried employees? Payouts for people who are already pensioned. So, but it's got medical life benefits. And it's got people who retire benefits. still have, are entitled to benefits. So yeah. these are the expenditures of people that when they retire, then, these employee benefits on page 90? Um, some of them, when we get there, <laughs> okay. get more that's detail. For you. Thank you. So there is a temp person that's not on the line item that's part of this department? Yes. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Total economic statistics and federal fiscal relations, 10,063,900. Shall it carry? Sure. Offices of the Comptroller. Financial Information System, Accounting and Procurement. Appropriations provided for the controllership, con, controllership sorry, services to government, which includes maintenance of the province's accounts, preparation of the public accounts, auditing and monitoring of related revenues and expenditures of operating policy over the province's financial information system. Appropriations are also provided for the procurement of goods on behalf of departments and agencies. Administration, 23,000. 400, equipment 5,700, material supplies and services 5,600, professional services 25,600, salaries 1,887,100, travel and training 13,400, total financial information system, accounting and procurement 1,960,800. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Can you give us an update on the implementation of the new procurement legislation? Um. I'm not sure what led this for the purchase of goods. The so there was new legis. You mean f that was uh, enacted last year? Yeah. Uh, November fifteenth, two thousand twenty. Actually. Yeah, we haven't seen the Treasury Board policies updated as yet, as far as I'm aware. Oh, I see. So, so you're wondering when the Treasury Board policy mm -hmm. associated with this will be updated? Yeah. Uh, I know they're working on it. Um, but I can try and find out when those will be updated for you. Yeah, that'd be great because that's okay. the that's the implementation aspect, right? And where we normally would see regulations and so on. In this case, that's the, that's the kind of the do part of the. Um, and I guess the follow up to that is: is there any timeline on when we um, ex uh, would be looking at legislation for the procurement of services? Uh, I don't have any information on that right now. Okay, that's all from me, Chair. Shall the section carry? carry? Total office of the Comptroller, 1960800 Shall it carry? carry? Taxation and property records, administration. Appropriations provided for the administration tax audit collection and inspection activities, tax processing, tax information and interpretation, registry of deeds and mapping services, property assessment and geomatic services. Administration, 86500 debt 400000 equipment 25500 material supplies and services 78000 professional services 100 and 2,000 salaries, 4,621,800. Travel and training, 90,500. Total administration, 5,404,300. O'Leary Inverness? Uh, just on the section there on debt, uh, it says $400,000. Is that like for those seniors to, to do the property tax deferrals, or is it a case where it's outstanding interest on debt for property taxes? Or I'm just wondering what debt would be. It's just a provision for uncollectible. Uh, so it, there's always going to be some taxes that are deemed uncollectible, even through the review process or collection process. So um, currently that's about 
0.275 percent of total revenue. So you're writing that off? Um, this is an allowance, so you record an estimated expenditure for possible write-offs, and then after the time has passed, then we would do a write-off, but it, but it had, would already be expensed as potentially uncollectible. But I thought you didn't write off. That was the whole debate we had with the with, with the bill that I had on the floor there. That you you basically would put those properties up for tax sale. Was was my understanding? And I, or or is it a case that you don't get the money back on the taxes that you were owed on the sale? I mean, just I'm trying to get some better explanation because it sort of questions our whole debate. <laughs> so. Um, and I don't have all the step-by-step -step details, but typically how it would work is they would do a re review and then set up an allowance, and then after at least a year, um, then they would go back, and after all collection processes hasn't worked out, then they would do a write-off, uh, Treasury Board submission for write-offs of uncollectible debt. But the expense would have happened through this process of... So so you're sort of saying that uh, you, these are properties then you don't put up for tax sale? Because I'm assuming if you put them up for tax sale, you're getting your, that's where you get your money back. And every year there's a certain amount of properties up for tax sales. So, Minister, I mean, you, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll bring that back, Honorable Member. I'm not quite sure the details, but um, I would, I'm not sure whether it would be rating off the, the interest that we would have uh, Incur, you know, we, we're not getting the interest paid, right? Even even when possibly when the property is uh, well, I, put I, up for sale. I certainly get the point. After the legislation that we yeah. put through, you have that <laughs> that, that ability because yeah. that's what the whole legislation was. That's why this sort of raises a bit of a question mark to me. So you were doing that because, like I say, I went through the whole debate with our tax commissioner that there was no ability to do that, and uh, when you put your properties that. You, you do have arrears. There's people who do not pay. I, I totally get that part. But at some point in time, once it reaches a certain threshold, you refer that then to uh, a lawyer to put the property up for tax sale. And at the time of the tax sale, that's usually the reserve bid is usually the outstanding taxes owed, and you get your money back. So that, that's where I'm just sort of questioning where the debt is sort of coming from in this for my whole explanations of how I understood the tax system to work. Sure. So as part of the review, never, you're never going to have 100% collectability on your revenue stream. So we always have to have an allowance of some sort. So they look at the historical trend of, of what's been collected, and the auditor reviews that, and we set up this allowance every year. And, and taxes may be written off for a multitude of reasons. Uh, bankruptcy would be a large one for individuals hmm. where we don't have the ability to collect once they're bankrupt. So those would be written off. And then in a future year, if we do sell the property, um, there would be a revenue line recovery. So it, they're kind of two separate transactions, so the recovery doesn't get netted against your bad debt expense. Mm -hmm. It shows up as a revenue line. But I do know when a property goes, or when a person goes through bankruptcy, I mean, there is still a provision that you're going to get a certain amount of money back on, on the amount. That number seems like a high number. Is that, so that's traditionally what the number has been over the last five, ten years? Or, I mean, 400,000? I think it got increased to 400 last year or the year before. Um, and it's, it's based in a review by the Auditor General, basically, of, of assessing the collectability and... Mm -hmm. um, I said it's only 0.275 percent of our total revenues, so it's. So, so how much would be outstanding right now of property taxes from the past year that would be not paid? I mean, it says a total number. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't I'm assuming that. it would I did probably be that. in the millions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did have that, but I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back for sure. sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess my other quick comment would be just on salaries, and, and I like I say I appreciate. Uh, the, the work that that staff does down there, but that's quite a significant increase over uh, what you spent last year in the forecast. So could you maybe explain what the 4.6 uh, million in salaries would be? Is there additional people there? Yes, yes. So we do have three additional resources for the registry office. 
uh, to deal with the increased volumes. So there has been significant uptake with uh, property sales right. and whatnot. So, um, and we also have a new project officer to support changes needed within the current system. Um, and then there was also uh, two positions that were only budgeted part of a year last year that are now fully funded. Okay, thank, thank you, Chair. Charlottetown Belvedere. Hmm. I don't know if I have any further. Oh, okay, yeah, no, I do. Um, it's like, uh, can you tell me if there's um, any efforts underway to monitor property speculation on PEI? Sorry, I missed the first part of that. If there are any efforts underway to monitor property speculation here in PEI? And we've had that discussion. Uh, I guess, again, the mechanism behind, you know, how you would, how would you do that and, and what um, equates to property speculation mm. versus just having a, another property, um, it's, it's definitely something we've talked about for sure. So I, I, we haven't got anything in writing right now. Um, thank you. Yeah, and I definitely, you know, we've, we've been uh, really clear look, in terms of the jurisdictional work that, that we've done and, and we've talked about in the House that, um, you know, when we talk about speculation, we're talking about sort of that purchasing of enough properties that it actually tilts the market versus somebody having a second home or a retirement home or a cottage or whatever that might be. Um, and so part of that is access to the data. Um, and there's a couple of challenges there. One of them is you've mentioned recently that, well, that CRA has, <laughs> that CRA has better income and tax data and demographic data than we have access to. Is, is that, that data sharing one of, the, one of the barriers or is that separate for when it comes to property? I kind of got the impression that that was a provincial, more provincial jurisdiction. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that would be something through CRA that we would deal with. Um, CRA would be more, they would have, you know, the assessments of people, you know, their tax assessment and the ability to determine whether they met a threshold if right. they were going to, you know, give them their 110 or $140, yeah. And, and do we have access to that data from CRA when it comes to the threshold analysis? Is that something that we, we get? No. No? No. no. Okay. Um, the other piece around, around properties is it, the question on whether there's any plans to improve Islanders' ability to access property records. GeoLink is old, <laughs> not very user-friendly. Um, I don't have to use it as much as you do, and it's not very fun. So I'm just wondering if, you know, like, I know access to data is something we've talked about a lot, and it's that kind of democratization of data. Um, is that something that is underway? Yes, there is a capital project, actually, to upgrade GeoLinks. So. Oh, you're making some people very happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Including me. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and analysis, and a lot of it is the, it's the reporting and analysis piece that we miss from that. You can do, if you know what you're getting to, you can get one record at a time, but sort of beyond that, certainly from the public-facing piece, is really difficult. So. And we are doing a lot of work of scanning old documents mm -hmm. so that they're available electronically as well. They're also very helpful. That's great. Um, yeah, I think I think... That, that's it. I mean, the big, the, the big the piece is around, you know, we've had a conversation in public accounts around the, the managing and tracking of property taxation and, um, and just sometimes there's some very large gaps in the, that kind of conclusion of records to my colleagues, you know, points around outstanding records and sort of the years sometimes it takes for those properties to get closed. I think there was a question of sort of, sort of what happens to the properties that the province ends up owning. Like, what do we do with those? Um, do they become part of the the Crown land inventory or, you know, and, and so those are questions that we could maybe follow up on separately. Um, but the general approach of access to information is, is sort of a big piece around property, around property records. So, yeah. I think it's something we're continually trying to up date and upgrade and yeah. you know you, you tend to, to deal with the pressure points first you know yeah. and then work from there so yeah just the other connection is back to when we talked earlier about economic analysis and some of those kind of bigger pieces around especially around taxation has there ever been any thought about doing a more progressive scale of property taxation here you know we, we know that sort of as property values increase and there are those kind of different levels of property ownership um, so other jurisdictions are looking at sort of doing effectively higher property tax charges for more expensive properties because the, the cost of service is higher as well, or, or a different size property, for example. Is that something that we would look at here to basically make it more, again, more democratic in terms of, of fair, in terms of the cost of property tax? So we do have a new uh, project officer in this budget to help look at the current system and look at 
things like that. Yeah, yeah. Because in our rapidly changing market, that's one of the pressures that we're hearing from municipalities is that the revenue they're getting from property taxes is, is getting harder and harder to balance that against the the cost of delivery of service. I guess the other piece is also part of that review would look at could that potentially look at how much of the property tax envelope goes to municipalities where um, I think the Federation of Municipalities, the PEI Federation of Municipalities has asked for that to be reviewed. Um, I think in their 2021 budget submission it was a very clear ask. There are many asks. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, again. But, but certainly one that represents yeah, balancing, that. Yeah. You know, that's a significant one when mm -hmm. it comes from the whole of the Federation yep. of Municipalities. That it's, it was, it was pretty specific and, and um, again, Minister, I'm happy to sort of follow up on that with you in another space, but as part of that progressive review of property taxation, I'm hoping that all things are on the table. Uh, yeah, no, we definitely will take that, you know, take that under consideration and, and uh, but I have to say, like, income tax framework is probably a higher priority than that, so, you know, looking at, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm just thinking from the perspective of municipalities that are that are that, that frontline deliverer of service, right? And, and and how do they balance that expectation of need? So, yeah. Thank, thank you. you, Minister. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Carry. Sure. Total taxation of property records five million four hundred four thousand three hundred. Shall it carry? Carry. Treasury Board Secretariat. Administration appropriations provided for Treasury Board operations. Fiscal management and secretary to Treasury Board, including appropriations provided for the preparation of the budget estimates and forecast documents, and providing analytical support and advice to Treasury Board and government on financial matters. Administration, 13,000. Equipment, 5,000. Material supplies and services, 4,800. Professional services, 5,000. Salaries, 965,000. Travel and training, 7,100. Total administration, 999,900. Charlottetown Belvedere. Policy is not publicly available. I, I think they're working on it. I'm, I'm not sure the status. I know as recently as last week they were discussing it. I'm just not sure what stage they're at of putting them up. Okay. Yeah. And they would be, would they be made when they are put up? Will they be made like that's us through the government website, like through Info PEI or as one of the documents that's available as publication? I, I would say once they're ready, they will be published online through the government. Yeah, yeah. Would well, you be able to come back time. with a timeline on when, when yeah. you're hoping to, to do that, even if it's a staged rollout, yep. given that there are a number of them? Yep. Sure. Thank you. Shall a section carry? Sure. Carry. Corporate finance appropriations provided for administration and management of financial and budgeting matters for departments and crown agencies. Administration, 28,900. Equipment, 1,000. Material supplies and services, 3,900. Salaries, 5,710,400. Travel and training, 21,600. Total corporate finance, 5,765,800. Shall the section carry? Je Sorry, Chair. Charlottetown Belvedere. Um, we had had a number of discussions about um, the tabling the public accounts for um, crown agencies. Um, we had discussed it relatively recently through public accounts and a number of other things, written submissions and so on. Are we any further along in, in I mean, some of those we see through um, the annual reports, mm -hmm. though they may be not timely. Um, so do you get more transparency in, in the, um, the financial activities and, and the decision making that's happening in, in uh, Crown agencies is a, is a priority for the House? Mm -hmm given the amount of money that sits, you know, it's a significant amount of money that sits in under the management of those agencies. Is, is there, are, where are we at with that? So we did move forward this year with it, at least breaking out the revenues and expenditure lines yeah. within the budget book, which helps with the reconciliation between public accounts and the budget document. Yes. Um, I'm not sure what the next phase of that is, but okay. certainly we ch we tried to make sure that that was included in this year's budget. Yeah, and, and much appreciated. Um, I mean, so obviously to be able to have a fulsome discussion about it is to the next level, and that may not happen here on the floor. That, but but it's about it needs to happen in public, yeah. and and that absence of, of granular information, you know, when we just have a line item, we just can't. 
we have no idea what to ask, um, and it's not fair to the the employees of the or no, well, the representatives of those organisations to have them come in and say we don't know what we're going to talk about. So you know, in that aspect, when we're talking about that huge amount of money that is being sort of managed in those arms length spaces, we still have an accountability to to ask the questions on it and be able to sort of follow up. So, yeah, well, take that back to. Thank you. Yep. Much appreciated. That's it, the chair. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Information technology and shared services appropriations provided for the administration and management of the corporate IT shared services. This includes corporate, enterprise, architecture, business infrastructure, business application services, digital services, delivery, security services, and document publishing center, Queen's Printer. Administration, 1,295,700 equipment, 229,000 material supplies and services, 15,874,800 professional services, 4,943,900 salaries, 21,694,300 travel and training, 665,600 total information, technology, shared services, 44,703,300. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, there's a, obviously a huge expenditure in this space, um, and I am never going to argue about spending money on information, technology, and shared services. However, I do need to ask you some questions about it. Um, and um, a large chunk of this, you know, we've obviously seen some really significant projects, you know, moving forward, whether it's modernization of, of specific services and delivery, or whether it's just overhauling access to records, or whatever it may be. Um, I guess the, a large chunk of this is, is you, there are only so many projects you can do in a year, and you've got, um, oh my gosh, what was it, like 15 million? Um, and often with IT, you're going to spend more salaries than you do on the actual, or on consultant costs or whatever, because it's manpower, or people power, not manpower. Um, what, with all the projects that are listed on here, are these all ongoing, or are some of these ones that are finite and they're going to be replaced by new projects? Do you have, because these are all obviously the last year's stuff, so what are we looking at in this coming year? coming year. Is it more of the same or are there new things that are rolling out that we should be thinking about? So sorry, you're, are you referring to the professional services? Well, you, well uh, sorry, in our, in our, yes, professional services. Okay. So we have, you know, uh, you have a range of your consultant type right. investments. Six Sigma is something that I know is really important, but for yes. a minister speak about, for the environment speak about the importance of that. And then you've also got things like case management software and planning decision software and fleet management. Right. So some of these I see as ongoing recurring costs and then others are kind of big ticket project management projects that are going to come to an end and then you're going to start new ones. What's on the radar? Right. What, can, is there a way we can see the difference, I guess? Well, um, as a generality, the the computer services section of the professional services are more the ongoing support required for maintaining our systems. Right. Whereas the consulting section really varies depending on clients' needs in any given year. So we have been focusing a lot of our time on, on uh, digital strategy, uh, digital modernization, of course. Um, We've had to do a lot in a very short period of time <laughs> uh, with COVID, obviously. We've, we've gone leaps and bounds ahead of where we ever dreamt we thought we could be within that time frame. So um, with that comes other things that were set aside to, hmm. to get those things up and running. So those do fluctuate from year to year, um, but our focus through our strategic plan is definitely on uh, digital strategy and digital modernization. And absolutely hear it in terms of sort of, you know, um, needs must acceleration. Um, and then that means other that, that you've had to choose other things that don't get done. I know we've talked about electronic medical records, and even though it doesn't, it's going to be supported in here, like yes. and it's the, the, the line item shows up in Health PEI, that may not necessarily have the same acceleration applied to it as case management would have, which has a direct HR impact or not, I don't know. But there's, um, you know, the breadth of this is, is significant, and, and what I see when I look at this um, are, particularly in the bigger piece ones, are very much around that, around the management of cases, the management of systems within our social services, um, which really speaks to that need to find different ways to deliver to the client. Right, and we're also looking at our systems, and, and instead of having one-offs, we're trying to be able to use the same infrastructure yeah. uh, to support many different needs in the departments. One of the challenges that we have talked about consistently from an impact 
human impact perspective is the, the siloing of particularly things like case files from health to social services to education and back. Is that something that you have, you talked about a strategic plan, is that something that you have as an overall goal from the digitization is, is to sort of think about that from a from a human perspective? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's because it's, it, obviously, from, you know, we, we hear about it every day about and, and we understand where that comes from, but you are talking about legacy systems or paper-based systems yes. and a lot, or Excel spreadsheets. Yeah. Like, Excel spreadsheets are where things go to die, right? Like it's, you know, I love Excel. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that to an account. <laughs> okay. I really love Excel, too. I have, like, an Excel professional oh, yeah. expert <laughs> qualification or something, but you and I know that my version of Excel and your version of that spreadsheet could be the difference between whether somebody's file gets done or not, right? Yes. So, so it's, yeah, I, I hear you. I, I know. <laughs> Give me a great formula every day, and I'm a happy person. However... We know that for this, it's, it is where stuff doesn't get done, right? So yeah. um, you know, I'm really excited to see that piece, but I understand that these things take longer than that. They cost more. They take way longer than anybody ever thinks. They're always more complicated, and, and it is because you're doing it while you're still running the old one, and you've got to teach people, and nobody wants yes. to learn it, and they don't like it because they like Excel better. Um, so I guess my, I, my, my question, Chair, would be just sort of, is there any way that you could bring us back sort of what some of those kind of big picture projects are going forward? Um, you know, and, and I guess the difference between which are kind of your ongoing rolling IT support type things and which are the ones which are the big pictures. And then what does that look like? Like what are the big outcomes we're expecting to see? Um, that would be very, very helpful. And my last piece on this would be um, from the data nerd perspective is just way back in a few weeks just before COVID, we had a major, um, uh, it feels like a lifetime ago, but we had a major data the, breach. The event um, and and <laughs> I know it yeah. feels like a real, a really long time ago. Um, and we were doing, there was a lot of work that had to be done to sort of kind of reinforce and make our, our systems even more robust. And, and is that work still ongoing or is that complete at this time? At this time? Well, it's continuously ongoing. Um, we certainly have uh, put a lot of effort and resources into our security and that that does form part of our new initiatives um, we've we've done a lot of work so that now we can do more in-house we have more staff assigned to uh, security so um, although I don't want to get into the details no, of what we're doing but yep. um, it, it was a significant uh, addition to um, our budget this year related to security and mm -hmm. systems was uh, 567000 Yeah, I saw that there. Um, I guess that, 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 the, that what that connects to is, is that re uh, employee recruitment and retention in any kind of high ticket environment is tough at the best of times and this is one of those industries and it so is. you know how is is there, are there any issues, especially when you've got long-term projects that are rolling through, um, that can become a real challenge, you know, whether it's business analysis or project management or the actual program implementation. So how, has that had any impact on...? It certainly has. Mm. Um, we've tried many different avenues in order to um, try and get uptake on our postings. Um, and. Sometimes the expertise isn't there, and we do have to go external. We have to uh, hire a consultant uh, to do that work mm -hmm. for us. Um, so really, it depends on the, the scope of work, whether we would, if it was going to be a long-term right. or, or short-term, whether we would go to uh, the community for, for that support or not. Um, but we have taken several steps to rec recruit um, you know, contacting Holland College and UPEI alumni and instructors and uh, posting on Work PEI, Facebook, Twitter, uh, dealing with Newcomers mm -hmm. Association, um, LinkedIn, Career Beacon. Like, we're, we're trying everything we possibly can with... Um, it's well, just and there's a lot of competition for really good IT people yes. here because we have a very robust IT sector um, yeah. that, that is competitive, right? And, you know, and you've got Veterans Affairs are also have a strong sector, but, you know, just the private sector is really robust here. Um, the, um, I guess my, my connection to that one is you are spending a lot of money on consultants, and I understand, again, it, it, that's, that's why, that's where you get that expertise from. But um, 
you had mentioned it there where you get the, are you able to find those consultants locally or have, are you having to bring in consultants from ex, outside the province to fill a need? Like what's, I guess the emphasis would be to try and bring in people locally if you can. Right. Um, well, and we do go out for public yeah. tender on all of those that are uh, significant dollar values. So um, there's a range of beyond my scope of, yeah. of the technical expertise required. But that is all done through a public process. Yeah, and that comes, that comes back to me asking earlier about, about um, procurement policies for services, because consultant services, you know, in, in theory, in anything over um, uh, $50,000, yes. is it has to go to, to public tender, so it would yes. appear on the tender site, uh, as long as it's done as a larger, if it's done in a series of rolling 49,900, then no, but if you're looking out for like a one-off. Most of these are definitely. <laughs> I would say, looking, at the, scope, yeah. <laughs> looking at the scope of them, I would expect so. Um, okay, no, that's, that's, that's really helpful. Yeah, I think, I think the takeaway from that one is very much about sort of that capacity, um, because the pressure is significant, and, and the, the other connection to this is, is the pressures that have come from enabling workers, including provincial government workers, to work from home. There had been a commitment earlier um, in COVID that, that we would have one third of the workforce working from home, and, and you know we're probably not doing that right now. And is, is there any re is there an IT reason for that, or is that more just a changing circumstance? I would say that we we are doing that right mm. now. And uh, you know, through different departments, that looks different. You know, I'm sure ITSs would would, would be one of those departments where yeah. people have the opportunity to do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, as far as staffing, that's the biggest challenge I think in the department. But um, I just want to point out the work that they've ha done, especially during COVID, because yeah. uh, you know, all of the applications for all the programs. You know, we've had uh, the testing system, the VAX pass, the. Mm -hmm. Uh, test results online, the PEI pass, you know, all of that would have been done through ITSS. So, yeah. um, you know, there's there was a huge challenge there uh, for all departments, but ITSS and, and then actually keeping, uh, re <laughs> acquiring the, the staff, but then retaining the staff is, yeah. is an other huge challenge. Yeah, so. and the rollout, the rollout of on-demand mm -hmm. self-service, um, especially that, that kind of facing yeah. through those, has been absolutely remarkable. Yeah. As somebody who's worked in that field and known, I, like I know how hard it is to get those things out of the door and have them work, and, and just as, but the, you know, the fact that they're continually improving and yeah. expanding um, based on that feedback from users and, and the, the need, is, it's, it's been absolutely remarkable. You know, right down to the very early days when it was about applying online for yeah. funds, now to, like you said, that self-service for test results and all of the other pieces that go with it. So, and I know that that's, that's only a tiny piece of what the public would see um, when I look at a lot of what these other projects represent. Um, you know, so when we talk about the need of, you know, more client-based focus, it's recognizing that these are really large, complex, processes and projects that need to happen um, and that there is um, every step forward is a step forward you know and I, and I just really I really appreciate the, the I know I'm biased and I think even if I don't love Excel to death but, uh, <laughs> um, but I am I am really appreciative of, of that of that unseen work that's done by people who I know have put in some very long hours so thank you very much from me to them about about what that looks Absolutely. like. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Fellow section carry. carry. Total Treasury Board Secretariat, 51,469,000. Shall it carry? carry? Total Department of Finance, 71,623,000. Shall it carry? carry. Just staying on for employee benefits. Okay. Hey, honorable <laughs> members, we are now on page 90, employee benefits. Appropriations provided for government's portion of costs associated with providing employee benefits program. Medical life benefits, 400,000. 400,600, employee future benefits, 23,706,000, government pension expense, 39,875,000, pension management, 515,000, total employee benefits, 64,496,600. Shall the section carry? General government. Okay. <laughs> we are now moving on. Me Members <laughs> to general government, page 91. General government, miscellaneous general appropriations provided for the premier and ministers out of province travel, cabinet, protocol gifts, and other meeting expenses. Administration, 60,000. Material supplies and services, 35,000. Professional services, 35,000. Travel and training, 100,000. Total miscellaneous general, 230,000. Shall the section carry? carry, carry. 
Grants appropriations provided for grants in lieu of property tax. Grants two million fifty thousand. Total grants two million fifty thousand. Shall it carry? Carry. Government insurance program appropriations provided for insurance premiums to the self-insurance fund and outside insurers. Self-retained losses assumed by government and for a risk management consultant. The program provides insurance to all government departments, most crown corporations, and reporting entities. Administration three million four hundred seventy-five thousand. Total government insurance. Program three million four hundred seventy-five thousand. Shall a section carry? Yes. Contingency fund and salary negotiations appropriations provided for provincial government funding of unforeseen program requirements and projected salary negotiations within the public service. Grants and salaries six million fifteen thousand. Total contingency fund and salary negotiations six million fifteen thousand. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. This earlier and coming back to it, and it kind of fits a bit in this and a bit in the next section as well. But it's talking about you have that overall contingency envelope of um, 15 million COVID 19 contingency, 15 million for potato industry, and in this case, 6 million um, for unforeseen program requirements, projected salary negotiations. In relation to that, what impact do you think that the potential rising of cost of living is going to have on your upcoming negotiations with various contracts that are up for renewal? Um. Well, I'm not part of the the uh, team that goes into the salary negotiations, but uh, we do have a few that have already been settled, and we, you know, we look at that as a base. Right. Um, we try and be consistent, but that is up to the the bargaining yep. units to to work out. So, typically, I think, you know, it certainly will be raised by them. There's no question. Um, we try and be consistent, and and for those that have been you know, set already. There may be some pickup the next round. Like, I'm not sure the details, but it definitely, obviously, will be be a consideration at the bargaining table. Sure. And, and the reason for asking, obviously, there are a number of, of significant contracts coming up this yes. year. Um, obviously, we're sitting at, with the province with the highest inflation rate um, consistently. Um, and at the same time, this, this fund item is for... Um, unforeseen program requirements and salary negotiations. Yes. So when we discussed this earlier, we've already got a $20 million commitment. I don't know how much of that is going to be from this fiscal year, but um, so I guess that's my question, is how much of that is coming out of this fiscal? And then looking at this and that the other funds are actually for very specific things, not for cost of living. I'm expecting to see a, a supplementary come forward, you know, because we just don't have enough money in these in these contingency funds for the commitments that have already been made, and it's only May. Right, and and something very similar happened last year with yes. COVID, where we came back with a special warrant of fifty thousand dollars as our approved budget. Fifty head. million. Or, sorry, fifty million. <laughs> That's okay. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as as the expenditure budget. Uh, reaches its limit, then at that point in time, we would come back for a special warrant. Okay. Yeah. Um, and again, my, my reason for bringing it up is it's already been announced. Like, like yeah. you know, we have a very clear direction from the Auditor General and from the kind of Treasury Board guidelines regarding special warrants. Those warrants should be obtained prior to that expenditure being incurred. Right. You've, you've already got a commitment out the door. I think at least three and a half million of that 20 has already gone out the door because it's gone to social assistance payments to, right. you know. So you're already into your six million fund that was in the budget here. <laughs> And you need to hold some of that money back for salary negotiations that are upcoming. So, so we need to see that special warrant now before that money goes out the door for the remainder of the commitment. Well, it would. This is one vote for the for the total, and, and I, I don't disagree. But we have the ability to spend up to that amount, um, and whether it's it's earmarked for potato or COVID or uh, salary negotiations, at the point where we. We intend to exceed our spending limit. Right. It would be at that point in time, and I'm not sure as well. As some of the expenditures may have been in, in the previous fiscal. Right. Um, which we did have capacity within our, our vote to, to spend that money without having to come back. Right. Which makes sense. Charles and Belvedere. Thank you. So I guess. Knowing that I'm crossing over into the other one, but these things, I think it's because we know that that the overall envelope that you have actually includes fund items that are called something else but could be used. They, they sit as a general, you have a general bucket, the big bucket of we contingency. Have. Correct. Right. So what I'm asking then in that case is would you be able to bring back 
what if any of these funds actually came from the previous fiscal year that are being allocated for the 20 million for the contingency funds that have already been committed have any have any of those money come out of our previous fiscal year and then um, what you know because we've got a 20 million dollar commitment here we've also got some covid funds that have been expended we've got potato funds that have been expended we're already using these because that's what we do right we can spend from the budget on the assumption that it's rolling in right um which is why we should be able to do some of the other things that we're not doing yet but anyway um so if you could bring back which bits fit from the previous fiscal and which are coming out of this year's budget that would be very helpful for us to understand where we sit in drawing down against that big bucket so when we can expect to start saying we need to see that supplementary warrant come forward please right sure. right and that's and that's fair in terms of following the guidelines that are set by treasury board right. and just so you know the the accounting system wouldn't allow us to post an expenditure that would exceed that total right so. yeah so i know you're not a, you're not at 41 million yeah right, but, exactly. but, uh, you know, which is good mm -hmm. um but but given how we know how fast those funds can go out mm -hmm. the door and given that we know that we've got a, at a minimum a 20 million dollar commitment on the floor right now then then i think it would be fair that we're already at at least 50 percent of that so so if we could see where we're go where we're going it would be very helpful from that transparency perspective um and that's what i have to say about that Shall the section carry? Response and recovery contingencies. Appropriations provided for the expenditures related to government's ongoing response to the COVID-19 pandemic and in support of the potato industry impacted by the identification of potato wart in PEI. COVID-19 contingency, 15 million. Potato industry contingency, 15 million. Total response and recovery contingencies, 30 million. Larry Inverness. Uh, just, Minister, maybe you could give a, a bit more of an update, and I'm not sure if you know the answer, maybe others would, but so you've spent $13 million of the $15 million for the Potato Board Contingency Fund. Do you have any kind of a breakdown of what that was spent on? I know some of it went to the Potato Board, but uh, could you even provide us with a breakdown of what they spent it on? Um, the details I have surrounding that, uh, the Disposal Compensation Program was $10.2 million. Uh, the PEI Potato Board uh, slash Agro West Foods Project, 2.52 million. PEI Potato Board Advocacy Strategy Initiative, 360,000. PEI Horticulture Association, 12,000. And the PEI Potato Board for Communications and Documentation, 36,000. So. So the 360000 I'm assuming that's the, the Waldo went to Washington trip. Uh, can you give me a bit of a breakdown on what uh, that seems, how many people went on that or any, any details on? The, the only note I have is uh, that it was to carry out, carry out an advocacy strategy and target a digital marketing campaign to address the ban. Well, that, that was the digital strategy. It wasn't the, the trip that... I, I don't have any details. That's what we have. Yeah. What, was the trip through the department then, or, or through the premier's office, or was that separate? I'm, I'm not when I say trip, I don't mean it like vacation. I'm just <laughs> saying the, the lobby that was put down. But uh, I probably maybe could have asked the minister of agriculture when he was on the floor about that. Uh, we don't have the details on. Right. So the way that the way that this worked is that the department would have incurred the expenses, and then they would have billed us in lump sum. So I don't have the details of of the yeah. recovery to them. Well, as I recall, when we did try to get into those questions, it was more it was under the contingency fund, which is under your department. So that's what I'm saying. It's, it's great. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so there's still there's still say uh, two million left to spend. Is there any sense? of uh, that will be spent or not spent. And I'm, I guess where I'm heading for is the seed industry has been the one that's been hit rather hard. Uh, so there's knowing that there's at least $2 million there, uh, is there any sense of that that $2 million will be spent or, or? Well, this would have been only expenditures up to March 31st. Right. Um, so I this was this forecast was set in january so i'm not sure if there was additional expenditures beyond that 13 million by year end by march 31st um but we can we'll get bring those back details whatever we can okay well knowing that it would be a forecast it would be an estimate that you would have spent that yeah. so 
and, and that's the number, 13 million. So I guess you're saying that there may be a couple of million that's still sitting there then. Well, it, expenditures don't get carried forward to the next year. So yeah. in this fiscal, we have 15 million allocated for mm -hmm. potato ward, but it wouldn't be 15 plus two that we didn't spend. No, I, I get that. But, but in the end, though, your, the forecast, though, is a projection of what you were going to spend. Yes. So you're projecting you weren't going to spend two million. I guess is where I'm coming from. So uh, I, I would have argued that how could that have happened with an industry that's, especially the seed industry, uh, I mean, that may be more of an answer for the minister, as the minister of finance that knows how hard the industry was hit. It, it didn't spend $2 million. We'll bring back whatever details we can. This is what we have in front of us as far as, you know, what the contingency was spent on. But, but there was no budget <coughs> set for that. So, like, we assume it's $15 million for the new year, but we weren't saying it was going to be $15 million in 21-22. <coughs> so it's not that two million was unspent. This was an unforeseen event that we estimated would cost us 13 million in fiscal 21-22 <coughs> and 15 million in 22-23. Yes, but I mean, we, I, I get that it was an unforeseen, but it was, it was still an estimate that 15 million was to be spent and, and the forecast that said it was 13 million. So uh, and, uh, yes, it's all unforeseen, but uh, that doesn't still say that you shouldn't have, you know, that the forecast probably would have been 15 million. <laughs> Again, honorable um, member, this is what we have in front of us, so sure. we'll, we'll okay. bring back whatever we can. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Cheryl Town Bobadier. Thank you. Um, just going back to the contingency fund, then, do you have a list of the initiatives that were funded in the COVID contingency fund? I mean, or is that still going through with the Auditor General at the moment? Uh, it is. Uh, they finished phase one, as you know. Yeah. Um, phase two, uh, the latest indication is that they will be reporting on both phase two and phase three in 2022, according to their latest report. Okay. Um, and that will, that will take up to expenditures just to the end of March 31st, 2021. I'm not sure what the Auditor General's plans are for the continuation of the fund in the last fiscal. Okay. Um, and I had mentioned to the Minister of Environment, uh, Energy and Climate Action that we would hope to see a contingency fund for climate emergencies. So I will mention it again here. I told him he should bring a special warrant if he needs to do that, and I would support it, um, because that is something that we have been bitten by the last couple of years of, of needing to respond to a climate emergency and needing a fund to allow for that. So um, I know it's not here now, but that may be something that comes through. Um, and then the other question is, obviously, we've got a huge difference in, in the funding for COVID emergencies. We know that things are very different now than they were last year, but it's not over. Um, and so the, the question being, um, you know, again, what advice or analysis led to the decision about it being this much compared to the overspend that we've had previous years? where we're down to like 10 percent of the, the previous expenditure sure so the types of things that we were still anticipating even though we knew we were kind of coming out of this um uh we were expecting funding requirements for still the safe return to school from april to june yep. um vaccination clinics border patrol testing facilities which are starting to wind down now yeah um cpho enhanced staffing early learning centers and daycare centers, additional staffing, and some general economic recovery programs. But significantly less yeah. than, than last year. And obviously year. We, hope, we hope that that's, that's enough, right? That we, <laughs> we thought that we have to also be realistic that we're not done. So um, again, we have the opportunity. Should we need to re reflect on that and, and amend it, then, then the House is able to do that. Um, I would just ask that should there be a requirement for additional contingency funds that that's done through a special warrant before the funds are expended, please. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Chair. Total section carry. Sure. Total general government, 41,770,000. Shall it carry? Sure. You're doing the next package. <laughs> interest charges on debt, page 92. Interest appropriations provided for the funding of interest costs associated with monies borrowed by the way of insurance of provincial uh, debentures, treasury notes, as well as borrowing through the use of bank lines of credit and loans from the Canada Pension Plan. Debentures 106,514,800, 106,514,800.
Loans and Treasury notes, eight million four hundred thousand. Total interest, one hundred fourteen million nine hundred fourteen thousand eight hundred. Charlton Belvedere. The increase in interest being paid is that projecting the based on the increases that we're expecting <coughs> to see in the base rate? Um, well, we have in the budget an additional two hundred and fifty million of long-term borrowing, so that's why you're going to see the increase there. Okay, and that's in the usual schedule of the borrowing yes, cycle. That we've talked is. about that before. Yeah, mm -hmm. so not to be quite so freaked out as we would think to be when we talk about <laughs> borrowing that much money. Um, has there been any further discussion about increasing the amount of the portfolio that that um, in terms of sort of um, where the the notes are held into? things like the credit union versus institutions that are not locally based? Uh, I don't have any information on that at this point. Okay. I'll, I'll bring it up again in another forum. The minister's looking at me going, oh, yeah, I've heard that before, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just, you know, it's my annual opportunity to raise it to you, minister. Um, that's, that's good. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Promissory notes for pension funds. <laughs> Interest costs associated with the promissory notes provided to the pension funds. Interest, 16066800 Total promissory notes for pension funds, 16066800 Shall the section carry? Yeah. Total interest charge on debt, 130981600 Shall it carry? Carry. Yeah. Shall the budget carry? Yeah. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and the chair make a uh, report to the to Mr. Speaker. Shall carry, carry, carry. Honorable, <sighs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as chair of the committee of the whole house. I wish to report that the committee has gone through into supply of the her in supply to be granted to Her Majesty and has come to certain resolutions thereon. Which said resolutions I am directed to report to the House whenever it should be pleased to receive same. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that the report of the committee be received. Sure. Carry. Carry. Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? Honourable Member for Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, we cede our time. The Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that the or order number four be now read. Shall I carry? Right. Order number four, Temporary Foreign Worker Protection Act, Bill number 19, ordered for second reading. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that this House now resolve the subject. Second reading, sir. Uh, the second reading of uh, order number four. Sure, Karen. Here. Bill number 19, <laughs> Temporary Foreign Worker Protection Act, read a second time. Donable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Okay. Speaker, I'll try this again. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Honorable Premier that this House do now resolve itself in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Sure, Karen. Here. The Honorable Member from Tignish Pomeroy. Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please.
The House is now in the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the bill to be entitled Temporary Foreign Worker Protection Act. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Good afternoon. Would you please state your name and position for Hansard? Patricia McPhail, Director of Labour and Industrial Relations. Thank you very much and welcome. Um, Promoter, would you like to begin by uh, just giving the general uh, a brief statement on the bill's intent? Sure. So, uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. So, uh, this bill uh, is second reading now. If uh, if everybody remembers, this is one that we uh, went to committee uh, on education and economic uh, uh, development and uh, had input uh, from all parties. Uh, so, I want to thank begin by thanking all the committee for the work that uh, you've put into this. I would also uh, like to thank uh, the official opposition and third party for uh, some of the work you have done behind the scenes, as well as the Cooper Institute uh, that has been pushing this bill, uh, I think, since about 2018. So uh, a lot of work uh, ha has happened, and, uh, and uh, we're, we're here to, uh, to, to debate the bill. Uh, after um, consultation, I guess, with, with the committee and the re recommendations, uh, uh, Chair, I'd like to uh, move four amendments, um, if, if I could do that. If you want to give me one moment, sure. I'm just going to ask uh, it's the pleasure of the committee that the bill be now read uh, clause by clause, section by section, or just open it up as a whole? Section by section, please. Section by section? Okay. Can we take your amendments as per section? Yep, we okay. can do that. Uh, Minister, are you finished with your opening yep. statement? Okay. Okay. Again, on the room, I'm just going to ask for a little clearer definition. Do you, section for section, do you want to open it up? Uh, do you want me to read each section, or do you want me just to identify the section and open it up to questions? Okay. Okay. So, um, let me get in here. Here. Yep. So, section one is definitions. Any questions? Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Chair. And actually, I do have sort of a general question, so I hope that's okay just to ask that now. But I noticed that the, um, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm glad that we're uh, debating this bill today and that it's coming forward. I think it's a very important piece of legislation. Um, I'm just noticing that there, um, the Act doesn't include a purposes or principles section, uh, which is yes. pretty common in other pieces of legislation. So I'm just wondering why that would be. So purposes and principles um, varies per jurisdiction, per piece of legislation. So our legislative council office generally wouldn't suggest we have a prin principles and purposes in the legislation. Um, in this particular case, it wouldn't really add to the overall operation or interpretation of the legislation. It's quite clear what it applies to, who it applies to, and what it does. So it wouldn't necessarily add any um, interpretive value, which is part of the reason you might add some of that. So uh, if we don't need it, we tend to stay away from drafting it. Okay. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Chair. So just then, you know, just for the, uh, for having this on the record and just for clarity, because this is, you know, a brand new piece of legislation and is, um, you know, incredibly important for a, a very vulnerable group of workers. Um, so just to, to clarify what the, the um, I'm wondering if you can clarify what the purpose of this bill is so that we can have that clearly on the record since it's not in, in this, in the actual bill itself. Okay. Um, so... The bill serves a number of purposes. Um, two of the biggest pieces would be uh, regulating the foreign worker recruiter industry uh, in so far as Prince Edward Island can regulate it within our legislative abilities, and then to require employers to hire temporary foreign workers to register with the province um, subject to certain exemptions. Uh, there's other provisions in the legislation. Um, there's certain ones related to uh, prohibited practices amongst <coughs> recruiters and employers. Uh, there's certain ones um, that spell out clearly uh, rights to information for workers. So that provision, um, there's provisions in here that require recruiters and employers to supply information to temporary foreign workers on the rights under this legislation, as well as any other rights we require under regulation. Um, I'm not sure that I've covered everything, but that kind of gives that broad, the main elements of it. 
and it sets out an administrative scheme for the whole thing as well. Tyne Valley, Sherbro. Thank you, Chair, and yeah, uh, thank you, Patricia, for that. I think that does give a, an overview of you know what are the, the technical components, but I think you know what what is important to note here is you know just before we get sort of into the, all of the technical pieces of this bill is that the this act as I see it, um, and I, Minister, you can clarify if you think this is wrong, uh, but it, the aim of this act is to prevent abuse and exploitation of temporary foreign workers, and that seems like maybe that is obvious, but I do feel like it's really important to to state that that is the in, intended goal of, of the work that, that uh, we're doing here, because uh, for far too long um, there have been uh, issues that temporary foreign workers have faced. So, is that fair to say then? Is that the purpose? You would say this is the purpose, perhaps? I mean, I would, sir, would like to. I would say that's fair. Yeah, yes. sir. Yeah. Time Valley Sherbro. So going into section one, so good, I'm glad to hear that, first of all. Um, just uh, an inspector is uh, um, defined as an inspector appointed under section three of the Employment Standards Act. So how many mm -hmm. inspectors are there under the Employment Standards Act? Uh, currently, there is one inspector under Employment Standards at this point in time for for administering the Employment Standards Act. I value sure, book. So that person's probably already quite busy then, I would expect, if there's mm -hmm. just one. Are there plans to appoint more inspectors uh, to in in conduct inspections? That would be the intention, yes. I value sure, book. So will you have any um, dedicated inspectors simply, or not simply, but specifically uh, to uh, conduct inspections in relation to this act? So yes and no. Um, the when I did uh, consultations with other provinces about their uh, temporary foreign worker protection act or their equivalent legislation, um, the indication was certainly that there is a lot of overlap between employment standards complaints and complaints under this legislation. So we expect that uh, though we'll have inspectors who maybe will be primarily responsible for this legislation, they'll also have responsibilities under the Employment Standards Act and vice versa. So that a complaint can just be dealt with by one inspector rather than hiving it off into different uh, different portfolios. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, and just to get uh, a little more clarity on that, so you have one inspector, you're expecting to go to two, three, what, what is the plan there? Uh, currently, the proposal is to add one and then uh, see over time how that goes. Um, I mean, what's also going on with this is we're also doing a comprehensive review of the Employment Standards Act as well. So. We expect there to be further changes, but I can't really get too far ahead on those ones. So um, I, I don't make the ultimate decision on resources. That really has to go to government to make those calls. Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Uh, that's all, Chair. Shall this section carry? Section 2. Any questions? Shall Section 2 carry? Section 3. Um, Minister? Thank you, Chair. I would uh, like to move an amendment. Uh, bill number 19 is amended in subsection 3-2 by the deletion of words may appoint and the sub substitution of the words shall appoint. Thank you very Can much, Minister. A copy will be circulated. Are there any questions on this amendment? <laughs> Shall the amendment carry? Carry. carry? Shall the section carry? carry. Part two, um, <clears throat> section four. Any questions on this section? Shall I, uh, Tony Valley, Sherbrooke. Uh, so. Um, so subsection 2 allows cabinet to exempt a prescribed class of persons from uh, the requirement to be licensed. So just uh, do you have any ideas on what these classes could be? At 
present, there is no plan to add classes, but um, given the ever-changing nature of the federal temporary foreign worker protection, or sorry, temporary foreign worker program, it may be that in the future it makes sense to exempt certain classes, but that would be done, uh, the plan is not to add any regulations unless there's consultations through public spheres on those matters. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, so you don't uh, anticipate any classes being exempt at this time, but it's at this time, no. Okay. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Uh, that's all, Chair. Thank you. Shall this section carry? Yeah. Section five. <clears throat> Shall this section five carry? Time Valley Sherbrooke. Just a quick question on this. So, just to clarify, when uh, we're talking about an individual here, do we mean like a, a, an actual person, uh, not a corporation? Right. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Chair. Shall Section 5 carry? Carry. Section 6. Shall Section section 6 carry? Carry. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you. So, um, Clause 61B uh, requires that a person applying for a license file um, security with the director in accordance with the regulations. So, um, do you have any sense of what the value of the security will be? That is something that's not decided yet. Um, that's going to be determined through the consultations on the regulations. So that was one that um, we discussed with the Cooper Institute and several other agencies that we're really going to have to nail down what's the appropriate amount. So some jurisdictional scans specifically on what other jurisdictions do, what's worked and what's appropriate. So I don't have an answer yet, but there's work to be done specifically on that one. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, so that jurisdictional scan has not yet been completed then? Partially done, but it'll need to be updated because when this started versus now, there's right. been some changes, so okay. we'll be updating. Yeah. Time okay. Valley Sherbrooke. Um, and uh, Clause 61C, um, it, in effect, it allows the director to require additional information or materials to assess the application of a person seeking a foreign worker recruiter license. Uh, do you have a sense of what other information or materials might be required to assess an application? So off the top of my head, um, I'm not sure. I don't have any specific notes on this. Um, what I'm thinking is, like, one example I could come up with would be, are they registered in another province? So if they have a, a recruiter license in another province, that might be some information that we're looking for and what their history has been in that other province. But that's just one example. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have any further notes on what was thought along those lines. But um, if anything becomes uh, very formulaic that we'll be asking for, we'll be adding it to the regulations. So that clause really um, adds some flexibility in addition to that reg making power where it provides a black and white list but if we see things that we need to ask further questions clause c really gives that broader power to ask more questions i'm valley sherbrooke so okay so will this then be uh, again another piece of that consultation that will take place on the regulations um uh in order to decide what additional requirements might be prescribed in the regulations yes in d the that reg making power under d will be consulting on that time valley sherbrooke okay. all right that's all thank you chair shall the section carry, carry. section seven shall section cap seven carry section eight We'll check section eight, carry. Sure. Time Valley Sherbrooke. So, um, so sections kind of eight to ten, actually. So, just uh, the, the, my question sort of covers all of that. So, these sections deal with the suspension or cancellation of a foreign worker recruiter's license. So, mm -hmm. if they were already offering services, these recruiters would have connected TFWs with island employers. So, are there any anticipated supports? for TC TFWs who might be affected by a suspension or cancellation of the recruiter's license. So they're kind of already sort of in mid-process or have already, you know, they might just be left in limbo, I guess. So it might depend on where along the process they are. If they're already with an employer, it won't impact that what's done is done. Um, but if they're kind of mid-process, it may impact it. So it will really... Um, I think that'll be, depend on the factors involved, uh, but our office, if, if there is any issues that are created by the suspension of a license, um, our office would strive to kind of bridge any problems that do exist. As of right now, I'm, it's not been raised in other jurisdictions that this has created problems like that, but if it does, we'll be very mindful of it. Tony Valley Sherbrooke. So there's no, um, there's nothing clarifying in this act sort of what uh, TFW might do or what the process might be if they feel they or if they 
require supports as a result of a suspended uh, recruiter's license. There's really, there's no mechanism, I guess. Is that something that could be in, in, the, in the regs or how, you know, what, how would you, other than saying you'd be mindful of it, I mean, mm -hmm. a, a clear process would be much more comforting. I'm, sure. I'm yeah, I'm, and I'm not sure what the answer is um, right now. Uh, the issue that you're raising, um, it really would depend on, again, where the worker is in their process, mm -hmm. uh, what they would need. So it's not just a simple, like, we'll have this as the solution to all, because it would have to be tailor-made for each case. So writing that into legislation, um, I'm not sure the best way to go about doing it. It may be that we do need to put regulations in place to deal with that, but as of right now, I think it's more an operational side of things rather than the legislative side of things and the policy side of things. Um, so the operational side uh, may bring forward some issues. And I mean, the intention is always to move forward with the legislation so that we're covering any of those, any new gaps that are uh, brought to light, we can cover them in the future. But guessing at problems right now is maybe not going to give us effective solutions. So. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that really answers your question. I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. Um, so there may be some reg-making power to fill in any gaps that really can be pointed to, but speculating is not, uh, I, I couldn't make speculations as to what to do right now. Time to go to Sherbrooke. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair. And yeah, I won't, uh, you know, belabor this point, and I do hear what you're saying, uh, Patricia, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, just recognizing, though, that uh, you may need a mechanism to deal with any um, uh, issues that arise uh, for temporary foreign workers is, is very different mm -hmm. than trying to guess at what e each individual issue might be. So that's mm -hmm. all you know. I would suggest uh, it can't be perhaps in the legislation, as you say, but I do hope that that is a consideration moving forward. That's all for that section. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 9. Shall section 9 carry? Section 10. Shall Section 10 carry? Carry. Section 11. Shall Section... Time Valley Sherbrooke. So Subsection 2 allows Cabinet to exempt a person who is in a class of employers um, uh, prescribed regulations. So do you have any sense of what these class of employers could be? Uh, again, as of right now, there is no plan, but it's more, again, in giving that option that if changes are made to the federal program, that government's able to adjust and make regulatory changes to keep it um, consistent and compatible. So as of right now, no. And this legislation being modeled from BC, they, they haven't regulated any either. So um, I have a feeling it there won't be any, but okay. yeah. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Yeah, that's good to know. Thank you. That's all, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 12. Show, uh, Time Valley Sherbrooke. So do you have any sense of what additional uh, application requirements might be uh, specified in the regulations? Again, this is where I don't have my notes on okay. um, kind of what I have compiled on this with me. Uh, I know there were mentions of things um, during presentations to committee by Faye Faraday on this one and the mm -hmm. uh, licensing piece. So those, I have notes on all of those, plus uh, comments from other uh, individuals and stakeholders. And um, what I expect to see here, like the only one that I can suggest off the top of my head that will likely be here would be um, a check with whether or not the employer has been in violation of employment standards legislation. Okay. That one's easy because that falls under our division. So, and it's kind of easy and obvious. Um, but there might be other ones that are beyond that scope. So, uh, it will really, uh, how that list gets defined will be uh, based on the consultations that will happen on the regulations. So the, that's a fairly, both the licensing and the registration are going to be spelled out more in more detail in the regulations. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Um, uh, no, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carry, carry, carry. Section 13. Shall section 13 carry? Carry, carry. Section 14. Shall sec Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and, uh, and thank you, uh, Patricia, for indulging all these questions. I just want to, it is such an important piece of legislation. I really just want to make sure we get clarity on, on the record on some of these pieces. So 
Uh, under Clause 14.1b, uh, the director may amend, suspend, or cancel a certificate or registration if the registered employer has failed to comply with applicable labor legislation. So can you elaborate a little bit about what will be included under that umbrella of applicable labor legislation? So applicable labor legislation, uh, predominantly the Employment Standards Act, uh, but we've also got like the Youth Employment Act. Um, uh, because it uses the term labor legislation, it's not Employment Standards Act. Like we would have named that act if we meant that. So it yeah. could be uh, human rights. So discrimination in employment grounds under human rights, occupational health and safety, Workers' Compensation Act. So things pertaining to that realm of labor. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay. And so is there, there isn't a definition of labor um, legislation though, I guess. I'd, so just to assume sort of, or if it's in, in any way related to labor, that it would be under that umbrella? Yeah, it's, it's more, and I think that's why it's not listed off as this, this, and this, and this, is the broader umbrella is meant to be in play there. Um, I don't know if the term labor is defined in the Interpretation Act. Um, I don't think it is. Uh, so then you'd go to the ordinary kind of meaning of the term. So uh, broadly speaking, uh, the minister is responsible for labor and it lists off the legislation he's responsible for. So that would be the first go-to to understanding what is in play with respect to what the term labor legislation means. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. Uh, and so what would the threshold for a failure to comply with the applicable legislation uh, be then? Can you give me an idea of where that is? So, um, cause it's, it's general, it's quite a general yeah. statement, right? Quite broad. So I think in theory, for example, um, if an employer has failed to pay their workers' compensation uh, fees okay. for like three years, that would be not in compliance with labor legislation. Um, if they've had an order issued against them under the Employment Standards Act, okay. that would be, or um, if they've had, uh, say, a conviction in relation to an occupational health and safety violation, that would be. So there, there's a number of different possibilities. And it would be, again, very circumstance-driven. So mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there'll be some sort of guidelines on how that'll look. But uh, right now, we don't have that written because the act is still not passed. So right. not there yet. Okay. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And uh, do you have any sense of how that you know, sort of communication will work, I guess? How will the director under this act be informed of contraventions under other applicable labor legislation? So. Um, in theory, how it will all work is during the application process, an employer uh, would sign off saying they give permission to check with agency ABCD to see if they're in compliance. And so we'd send out uh, compliance request letters that would come back. So that's done with businesses when they sell currently. So we get lots of, in employment standards, we get lots of checks, um, requests to check to see if their employers are in compliance or not. So this is, it's relatively standardized operationally how this kind of works so okay. it shouldn't translate it shouldn't be too difficult to translate that into the inner workings of this legislation time valley sherbrooke okay um thank you chair that's that's all for this section. shall the section carry carry section 15. shall section 15 carry, carry. carry. section 16. Shall section 16 carry? Uh, 17. Shall section 17 carry? Time Valley Sherbrooke. So that's under part four. So I do have some questions um, that kind of apply generally to sort of all of part four. So we'll just, we'll go with some of those and, and see if that'll well, work. Your request, uh, it was with your request to go section by section. Sure. So, okay. yep. so um, will um, decisions to uh, reconsider licenses and certificates of registration be made uh, public? Um, the decision uh, itself would not likely be made public, but the outcome of this decision would end up being public information because um, with the uh, the licensing will be publishing that information online. So if a license gets redacted, that information will get published online, but not the decision. Like so, the written decision of the director, like all the details, wouldn't be publicly available um, because usually those would involve personal information. Um, not always, but sometimes. Uh, so, but the outcome would end up being public-facing information. 
Uh, Time Valley Sherbrooke, just to be clear, um, is it your intention now to maybe, or are you in favor of going to parts or? No, sorry, it's just for part four. It just so happens okay. that the questions yeah. apply to several of okay. the sections. Okay, so we'll re so remain, on, on, we'll have to remain a section. Yeah, then. well, that's okay. Okay. Right on. Okay. Um, so, um, so is there any uh, ability to appeal decisions uh, in this, uh, um, under this part of the legislation, I guess? Um, so this, it's called a reconsideration, but it's kind of a, it's akin to an appeal of a uh, decision. So it, um, once the decision is made by the director, it's meant to be final, but um, like other decisions of government bodies, I mean, a judicial review could be applied for the courts, but that's not the intention. It's meant to be that this is the final decision. Okay. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And so just to clarify in terms of what's made public, so if, if a license was revoked, uh, you know, that would be public, but is it only in that, like, warnings wouldn't be public or any other sort of stages leading up to that? <clears throat> I'm not certain of the answer to that. Um, in looking at other jurisdictions and how they've handled it, um, if you've examined Nova Scotia's licensing list, they'll put up as part of the licensing information, uh, information about um, parameters and restrictions on the license. So, I mean, that's tantamount to a warning, I guess, is what you're alluding to. So yes. um, I expect we'll be following a model that closely resembles that, but wouldn't be tagging that decision that led to that those limitations onto that information. Okay. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, good. Um, so uh, just, is there a reason why there is no power for cabinet to prescribe additional uh, prohibited practices via the regulations? <coughs> sorry, which section is that one? Um, sorry, I guess it's not in definition, so if you no. want to keep going, sorry. Time Valley Sherbrooke? Uh, that's, that's all for a Okay, shall the section carry? Carry. Section 18. Shall section 18 carry? There are portions here where I really yep. do have questions. I've just asked that question. Section, so. yeah. Yeah. section 19. Shall section 19 carry? 20. Shall section 20 carry? Time Valley Sherbrooke. So in terms of uh, decisions remaining in effect and reconsideration of decisions, I'm just wondering in terms of uh, the um, uh, prohibited practices that would be um, uh, lead to decisions, I guess, why, here's what I will ask, there is no power for cabinet to prescribe additional prohibited uh, practices via the regulations. It's something that I believe we saw in other jurisdictions. I'm just wondering why that wouldn't be included somewhere here. So I don't think that that pertains to section 20. I think that might be 21. Okay. okay. Yeah. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay. We'll go to, we'll ask that. Shall 20. section 20 carry? Yes. Section 21, Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay. That question. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Again. So. Yeah, she has one first. Too. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead, Time Valley oh, Sherbrooke. Yeah. Okay, yes, yeah. thank you. So. Just wondering, why is there no power for cabinet to prescribe additional prohibitive practices via the regulations? Okay, um, and I do not have uh, an answer for that question other than I did not see that in other jurisdictions, but uh, you're indicating that there was that power. Um, it is not something, we modeled this off of British Columbia, so I don't okay. think they had it, and um, I guess it's just not something that was thought of. Time. Can, okay, sorry. We ha there's an amendment on yeah. this one. Yeah. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And can you just tell us how you arrived at this list of prohibited uh, practices? Uh, what is this what you heard from stakeholders? Um, so it was a combination of things. So during the first round of consultations we did, um, there this does closely match what we heard from stakeholders. And then when we did a jurisdictional scan of what other provinces prohibit as practice, uh, this, again, it came from BC and it lined up almost exactly with what we heard from stakeholders, so that was how that list came to be. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Uh, I, um, uh, that's it. I do have other things in this section, but I think uh, I would. Do you have an, um, I do, but I perhaps. Yours is would for like section one. Do you, you want, want me, me to, to move first? forward? Okay. I can move, it doesn't really matter, the oh, section's wide open, so I will move to the minister. Okay. 
Thank you, Chair. I'd like to make an amendment. Section 21 of Bill Number 19 is amended by the addition of the following after Clause 3, additional prohibited practice. Employers shall not use the services of a foreign worker recruiter who is not licensed under subsection 4.1 unless the foreign worker recruiter is exempt from the licensing requirement pursuant to subsection 4.2. And we do have copies. Okay, copies are now being circulated. And we will continue debate once everyone has received a copy. Just, just one second, yeah. I just want to make sure everybody gets one first. Okay, Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, uh, just asking, uh, if the recruiter loses their license, what happens to the worker? So if the recruiter lose, loses their license, so um, this is similar to the question that was asked earlier. Um, it, that one's going to be very dependent on the circumstances. Like if the temporary, I will give an example. If the temporary foreign worker is still in their uh, country of origin and the recruiter loses their license before much work has started, they'll just, most likely, they'll have to start with a new recruiter. Um, but if the temporary foreign worker is already in process of moving here, uh, chances are there's no consequence. They'll just continue on here. If there's any hiccups, we'd assist where possible. But more likely, the hiccups would lie with federal jurisdiction in that transition, rather than with what powers we have. Charlotte, what's your role? So it's a federal responsibility. It's, it's a very split responsibility, but predominantly because a program is run under the feds and they are involved, so they have three different departments who oversee the program, um, ESDC, uh, Immigration, and um, the Border Services. So it, it's very split, but mostly, yeah, that transition from the, wor the worker being in their home country to getting to Canada, it, that's all under the federal jurisdiction where we're um, covering off that's not covered is that licensing of the foreign worker recruiters to protect um, unscrupulous recruiters who are uh, charging exorbitant fees to the workers. So that's what we're trying to do okay. with this. Charles, how much royalty? And and just I just want to ask the, the same question, but with an employer, if the employer loses their license, what happens to the worker? I believe there is provision that covers yeah, that. Um, but I can't remember what it says off the top of my head. I believe their employment situation would remain because, again, that's federal driven through the work permit. Um, so we wouldn't be able to say that they can't continue to employ that temporary foreign worker right now. But what we would do is prohibit them from employing further temporary foreign workers. So it's more a future based um, rather than we would never cut somebody's employment short. That's not our objective with this legislation, it's to protect um, employees from harm. Okay, great. Cheryl, how much royalty? That's it for me. Thanks, Chair. Um, any further questions on the section as amended? On the section, yes. We didn't vote on the amendment. Sure. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Shall I carry? Shall okay. the amendment okay. carry? Sorry. Okay. Any further questions on this section as amended? Time Valley Sherbrooke. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, um, so one of the things that we, um, you know, heard uh, as an opposition, but also, you know, in, in committee, so concerns from stakeholders that uh, some workers on PEI have been prevented from participating in um, community yeah. events or organizations, uh, even uh, church services um, by their employers. So, um, you know, that's incredibly concerning and something that we really feel needs to be uh, clearly prohibited because these are uh, temporary foreign workers are, uh, are are people who should be treated with the absolute respect of all that all workers receive here on Prince Edward Island. So it is critical that they have the freedom to associate with whomever they choose while they are here. It is uh, absolutely, I find, uh, just offensive to uh, to even. Uh, think for a second that any employer should be controlling who uh, they, their employee is associating with. So we need to be very clear in this act, I believe, um, to state that uh, that's not allowed. So this, uh, I have an amendment here that I would like to um, to table now on this section. Sure. And would you like to read it in two answers, please? Certainly. So. Um, 
moved that uh, subsection um, 21-1 of Bill 19 is amended A by the deletion of the period at the end of Clause E and the substitution of a semicolon, uh, comma, and uh, B by the addition of the following after Clause E. Take action against or threaten to take action against a foreign worker for associating with or attempting to associate with any person or organization for a lawful purpose. Eight copies of the amendment are presently being circulated. I'll give you one moment to receive and review. Chair? Okay, just want to make everybody gets a copy first. Mm -hmm. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm good with supporting that amendment. Okay. Any other debate on this amendment? Shall the amendment carry? Right. Shall a section as amended carry? Yes, carry. Section 22. Shall Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, sure. So this section prohibits a foreign worker uh, recruiter from charging a fee to a foreign worker for employment. Can you just speak to us a bit about the issues TFWs have experienced with respect to uh, fees being charged by recruiters and why this was a critical addition? So. This is an interesting piece. Um, most foreign worker protection legislation across the country uh, was brought in, I mean twofold, but this was one of the biggest pieces of why they were licensing uh, foreign worker recruiters is to prohibit exorbitant fees from being charged to the workers for finding jobs. Mm -hmm. um, the largest problem we have um, now is that the uh, recruitment that's happening outside of Canada is where the fees are being charged. So they've moved the wrongdoing outside of our jurisdiction. Um, so that's part of why uh, the amendment to section 21, um, the new subclass four was added to try to uh, help prevent that in, in the best way we can. Um, but because it's happening outside of our jurisdictions, there's not much we can do about it. But we, what we will do is within our jurisdiction and with, within Canada, uh, licensed recruiters are prohibited from charging fees if they're finding work for employees within Prince Edward Island. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay. So does the department intend to audit any of these employment contracts to ensure fees aren't being charged unlawfully? How will it, yeah. So the federal program requires um, employment contracts and those are fairly standardized and so those contracts themselves, I've seen them, they don't have any uh, permission to charge back fees unless it's part of the program. There is some exemptions to that under the federal program. Um, so auditing the, it, this is usually not happening under the employment contract where you usually see it as improper payroll deductions. So we already have the power to audit payroll through the Employment Standards Act, which is again why the inspectors are the same because there's so much overlap between um, the issues that arise. So we do have that power, but it's really more an employment standards issue, but it will be an enforcement of this act uh, in tangent. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And how will this be enforced then if someone is found to be in violation? So um, I can speak to currently what we're doing with employment standards has specific rules about what can and can't be deducted from payroll. Um, and under employment standards, in theory, they could create an agreement that allows for deduction for recruitment fees, but under this, it will prohibit that practice now. So, okay. um, but if they didn't have an agreement, which, as I said, the federal rules have specific contracts that spell this stuff out, yeah. um, what would usually happen is uh, we're going to investigate, uh, make a determination, and if we have to, issue an order saying you have to pay the employer, or uh, if it's an employer issue, they'd have to pay back the recruitment fees to the worker. Okay. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, that's good. Um, that's uh, all for this. Shall the section carry? Carry. Section 23. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you. So this uh, section requires uh, foreign workers and registered employers to make information to foreign nationals and foreign workers information um, uh, uh, if available about their rights under this act. So who uh, will be responsible to prepare this information? Sorry, are we on 23 or 24? 26, I thought. I'm on section 23. All right. Sorry. Nope. Okay. Uh, nothing. Okay. Until shall 26. section 23 carry? Yeah. 24. Shall section 24 yeah. carry? Yeah. 25. So section 25 yeah. carry? Yeah. 
Okay, section 26, Hind Valley, Sherbrooke. Right, so sorry. Um, so who, um, uh, the information under this section, uh, who is responsible to prepare that information? So the information would be prepared by um, the uh, Labor and Industrial Relations Division. Much like we do so with the Employment Standards Act, we provide information sheets um, available for workers and the general public. We even have those translated into a multitude of languages that are primarily spoken by people coming into uh, the province for work. Um, so that, uh, we already produced that and um, we publish it online and we have paper copies available at places like Access PEI. So under this system, uh, it's more likely that we'll be uh, specifically delivering some information packages to the employers and uh, recruiters so that they can distribute them. Mm -hmm. uh, now as long as, if they decide to create their own information packages it would have to be approved and say like okay this checks all the boxes you're allowed to use that so theoretically that could happen but more likely they're going to take our information and distribute it okay time valley sure and is that sorry uh, just to make sure i understand the language correctly is that laid out here in the legislation that it would have to be approved i'm not sure if it's in this section but it is in the act somewhere and um okay sorry off the top of my head i'm not sure if i could pull it out um okay. Yes, sorry, in a form provided or approved by the director. It's in subsection <coughs> 1. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Um, so I, I, I appreciate this, and I do have a, an amendment that I would like to uh, put forward for this section as well, because I do believe it, it's um, you know, based on the feedback that we've heard that um, we really need clarity um, that uh, the director is required to make certain information available to foreign workers, um, registered employers, and the public. So um, just, it sounds like that is the intention, but we really wanted to have that clarity in here um, uh, so that there's a, a, that obligation is clear. So shall I read that into the? Yes, please. So uh, move that uh, section 26 of Bill 19 is amended by the addition of the following after subsection 2. Director shall make information available. 3. The director shall A. Provide information to foreign worker recruiters and registered employers about the obligations under this Act. And B. Ensure that information about rights and obligation of foreign worker recruiters, registered employers, foreign nationals, and foreign workers under this Act is made publicly available. Is there any discussion on this amendment? Chair. Minister? No, yeah, I'll support that amendment. Shall this amendment carry? Carried. Shall this section as amended carry? Carried. 27. Any questions on 20? Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you. So um, can you explain what additional contract requirements might be prescribed by the regulations? Uh, at this point, I don't have that. Um, that's, again, going to be one of those through consultation. We'll get to know what uh, what we might be missing in this list, if there's anything missing. If not, then we won't be adding anything at this time, but we'd monitor it ongoing in the future to see if anything needs to get added through regulation. Time Valley Sherbo. And uh, since this is modeled after the BC legislation, do you have a sense of um, what additional like contract requirements they had prescribed? I don't prescribed? believe they so have anything else prescribed. right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> at this time, I think uh, they haven't added any regulations on this sub point. But again, it would be we definitely be when we go to the reg making process, we'll be looking back to BC and see what they've got just to get have the most up to date. But I mean, BC's ro legislation rolled out over a period of time as well, so they're still they're still evolving in their program. So. Okay. Thank you. Time Valley Sherbrooke. That's all, Chair. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Carried. Section 28. Time Valley Sherbrooke. So I do want to note here that you know some stakeholders had requested a longer record retention period. So I'm wondering if you can explain why the bill went with a 36 month retention period and not a longer one. So. That has to do with the interplay between the Employment Standards Act and this legislation, and 36 months is what's spelled out in the Employment Standards Act as well, so we mirrored those retention periods. Uh, we didn't want to, under our own legislation, have two different retention periods. Now, okay. once the comprehensive review is done, if they recommend a longer retention period, we'd mirror that in this legislation. But um, my understanding is that like, when they introduced that in the Employment Standards Act, that was a very agreed upon retention period for all parties at that time. So okay. now whether that's changed now, yeah. 
Right. Time value share rule. And of course, the implications mm -hmm. of that uh, length of retention period for the Employment Standards Act will be a part of that comprehensive review. Will there be any process to assess if there are any complications or issues that arise from the 36 month um, period uh, in this act once it is, uh, you know, should it be proclaimed and, and uh, all of that? Um, specifically, I mean, there's going to be like all legislation under my division specifically, we're always reviewing to see if there's any issues. So I don't anticipate based on the inner workings of this act itself that a 36 month would be a problem. It seems, um, it seems like it would be a quite appropriate uh, retention period based on the inner workings of this legislation itself. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay. Um, I guess to be determined on that when we see what happens with the employment standards review. Um, that's all for that section. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Section 29. Shall section 20, Time Valley Sherbrooke. So this section requires the director to maintain a registry uh, respecting uh, foreign worker recruiters and registered employers, but it only requires the director to publish information about foreign worker recruiters in, and this is a quote, any manner that the director considers appropriate to bring mm -hmm. the information to the public's attention. So it's pretty broad. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, why are we only publishing information related to foreign worker recruiters but not registered employers, first of all? So the intention of the department is to publish information on both. Okay. But um, during our consultations, and forgive me, I can't remember if it was the first round or second round, it was raised by employers a concern about publishing the information about registered employers. What happened during, um, it was the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Project, um, and, and this information was relayed to me, so I'm only relaying it in the way it was relayed to me. Um, it was raised that during, once the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Project list of employers was published online, uh, recruiters from outside Canada use that list to sell fake jobs to temporary foreign workers. Mm -hmm. And so uh, once the workers had already forked over the money to the uh, illegitimate recruiter, um, they found out later on through calling the employer that the jobs didn't exist. So it was being used okay. in it was more an immigration scam, um, but also job recruitment scam. So the concern is if that starts happening again, our only recourse would be to pull the list of employers from being online. So we didn't put it as a requirement in the legislation, so it gives that flexibility. But the intention right now is to publish both lists, okay. but it gives us that flexibility on the employer one to pull it down if we're finding out that there is fraudulent activity happening outside our jurisdiction. And it, it, it would really be our only way of stopping it is to just pull the list down. Sure, so then the the intention then uh, to start out would be to for the director to publish uh, information for both lists online. Um, right. uh, so that will be the okay, that's I understand. Shall a section carry? Yeah, carry? Section thirty. Shall section thirty carry? Carried. Section thirty one. Shall section thirty one carry? Carried. Section thirty two. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Um, sorry, no, so I'm sorry. Minister. Thank you, Chair. I would like to move an amendment. Section 32, Bill Number 19, is amended A by renumbering its subsection 32-1 and B by the addition of the following after subsection 1, periodic inspections. Two, an inspector shall make periodic inspections of registered employers to ensure compliance with the Act and the regulations. And we do have copies. Great. Copies are now being circulated. Just very quickly, I am in support of this amendment. It is uh, something that was brought forward uh, during consultations uh, that periodic inspections will be a critical way to ensure that uh, there's compliance with the Act, and uh, so I'm just in support. So, so. Any further questions on this amendment? Shall it carry? Yeah. Shall the section as amended carry? Yeah. Section 33. Shall it carry? Chair. Yeah. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Um, so, um, okay. So how will the department deal with uh, discoverability? Uh, in other words, how uh, does the time limit work when, uh, where there is a contravention of the act, um, but the facts are not yet made known to the person affected until some time after that contravention has occurred? Discoverability isn't contemplated within that, this legislation, nor is it under the Employment Standards Act. Now, that being said, um, 
an inspector who receives information past that complaint period may still be able to investigate to a certain degree. It's their capabilities of issuing the remedies might be more limited. Okay. Minister. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to make an amendment. Subsection 33.2 of Bill Number 19 is amended by the deletion of the words within one year and the sub substitution of the words within two years. Thank you very much. Copy is being circulated. And I will open the floor to debate momentarily. Okay, the floor is now open. Any discussion on this amendment? Charlottetown Belvedere. Can you explain the intent of um, the reason why you need to extend this period? Is it to allow for there being more time for that complaint to kind of go through the process? Or? It, not so much to go through the process. It's to allow them. Uh, once the process is it's initiated when the complaint is filed, so it extends that deadline for them filing that complaint from one year to two. Okay. We'd originally put in one year to mirror the Employment Standards Act, again, because there's so much overlap between uh, violations under both. Um, but the request was made to extend this uh, because foreign workers might be reluctant to file while they're still employed. Um, right. So that's part of why the extension's been made. Um, I am a little concerned about how this will play out as far as remedies go if there's a dual violation of the ESA, but since that's under comprehensive review, that might be aligned in the future. Charlotte on Belvedere. Yeah, so that, so this could the hour has been called. Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall carry. carry. consideration the bill to be intitled Temporary Foreign Workers Protection Act. I beg leave to report the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of the committee be adopted. Shula Carey. Yes. The Honourable Member from Morrell Donan, Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the member from Montague Cumer, that this House adjourn until May 4th, which I think is a bit of an anniversary, May 4th at uh, 1 o'clock p.m. Shula Carey. Anniversary. Yes. 